Just a few brief questions. Um, first of all, this is all a great, I guess it's a start, but it's a long start. Um, yeah, it's, it's obviously very good work or they wouldn't have named it after you, Barbara. So you know, mm. that's impressive. <laughs> um, I do want to ask about the, um, the task force that you mentioned, you talked about. I don't need specific, I mean, individual names, but what type of organizations, what type of, who, who, who makes up this task force? So the, the first phase was bringing district folks together. And in, I, on this particular task force, um, we had principals, we had different, um, we had, let's see, we had principals, we had home visitation program, we had special ed, we had um, budget there, um, we had health services, so a lot of the different departments. And one of the reasons for sort of bringing a smaller district group together, and, and actually I'm just naming like a few, but there were probably about 20, 25 people. Okay. Uh, was to get ourselves sort of lined up. We needed. We had a lot of different things, as Lawrence was mentioning, happening in the district, and we wanted to sort of pull them in and align our work. And then through that, we got input in developing the work plan. Our next phase is developing the larger committee, um, where we will have we have a lot of different community members and um, community-based organizations. And in addition to our parents and our, our parent groups. Yeah, you, know, I mean, and, you saw where I was going with it. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah, I mean, just I, I clearly, you know, I mean, I, I think it's a great idea to make sure that we, the right side knows what the left side does here right. before we go out. And But we do need to go out there. And I mean, yeah. it, it, there, there's almost as, as, as many reasons for for absences as there are absences. I mean, so, you know, we, yeah. and that's what I was impressed about is that what we're doing is really holistically you know, looking at this problem um, and uh, doing it in a very comprehensive way, and, and I'm very impressed with that. The funding that you talked about, you talked about the uh, the endowment as well as Sierra Health Foundation. Mm -hmm. Is that ongoing? Well, we got funding. Our first set of funding was from uh, primarily from the endowment and then a smaller portion from Sierra Health Foundation. The, the grant that we've submitted uh, recently is just to the uh, the California Endowment, and we're waiting to sort of receive that funding. But we're it's on good. We're gonna, but we're going to. I mean, I guess it, what's committed as far as the long term it, process? It, you know, they, so it, this will be a two year funding cycle, another two year funding cycle from the endowment, and this work is something that we need to. We're going to be taking on as a district. This will allow us to look at our data. We have a lot of the. Uh, templates in place to begin to continue to look at our data over the years beyond the um, this, this study. Though it does help to have our partners like Community Link and UC Davis to do that deeper dig because uh, they have ways to look at geo mapping that we don't have that capacity to do. But I think the next phase is really for us to get in there and do the work. I mean, you talked about that. We don't have the capacity to do it. But when this is over, are we going to have capacity? Yeah, to, so we'll to have capacity. Work? So the data will now be in, like, the data director. I'm sorry, the data dashboard. The dashboard. Mm -hmm. and, um, and on track. And that uh, Ken has been piloting in six schools this year. That will, all of our data gets, in, I'm not good with the technological stuff, but imported into these data systems that then principals can actually go on and see look at a list of who is chronically absent in their school at, 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 um, on track is real time and data dashboard is once a month. They can look at that and see and then target interventions with that particular population of students. Because what I, and I'll just end it with a comment more than a question and that's that, you know, what I want to make sure of, and I know you do too, but is that this isn't something that after the end of it, it ends up on a shelf someplace, and this is someplace. I, I understand that, but I have to say it. Uh, and this is something that will lead to real, you know, long-lasting, sustainable change, and that we have the capacity to do this work when UC Davis and some of this funding goes away. Yes. And that we're creating something with these outside resources, but that we're going to be able to do something with it internally that makes this a very useful project and program that's sustainable for the future. Yeah. And I absolutely agree. And I think that what, that what this has allowed us to do was to look at our data, to analyze our data. And the next step is for us to begin the work. And the work is in, in um, utilizing this data to provide the interventions, build the capacity internally so that it's ours. It is our work to do with our students. Yeah. And Hattie? Uh, so I, I 
I've worked with districts throughout the country, and so maybe it just helps a little to speak to the, you'll have to figure out what to do, but sure. once you have the data and you've built sort of capacity, it's about imp integrating attention and focus to the issue of chronic absence into existing resources, both in schools and in the community. And one thing is, this is not about triggering for punitive responses. Right. This is about triggering to identify who's at risk and therefore needs more support. So in New York City, for example, one of their models is a success mentor model, where they have a city year, they have um, uh, uh, different um, social work interns, they have a lot of folks who, when they know a kid was chronically absent, you use these existing programs and resources, connect them to the kids to support them, to find out what's going on, to make sure they're connected to you, new um, to community available supports to address the barriers, as well as to just it's you know sheer trusting relationships. And they've seen significant improvements in the attendance for every kid who has a success mentor. Um, on, and those schools where they've been where they're part of a data dashboard, that was not new resources. It was a leveraging of existing resources. Right. And so once you have the data and the supports, and you and I think uh, Mayor Johnson, there are other people positioned. Um, you can use it for figuring out where do you do asthma supports. I mean, there are real barriers. You can look at redoing transportation. Eventually, once the district has its resources in place, I mean, in terms of how to move it, you actually have to bring in community partners because it's not schools alone solutions. But we all even know after school, early childhood programs, all of those things can actually be de deployed in ways that reduce chronic absence. You just have to uh, create a different attention using real data showing how you target those resources and which kids might need a little extra attention support to make sure they get what they need and their families are engaged. I, I like the whole concept of removing barriers um, because it, it, it's not as much of a blame game at that point. And, it, you know, we're taking responsibility that there are things that we need to do uh, that actually remove those barriers and, and get these kids to school. So I, I And largely when we've been using truancy and unexcused absences, we have not been identifying kids who are chronically absent. Yes, a lot of it is illness. And then you want to figure out how to support and engage and make sure it, it's, it's really a different approach using existing resources. Thank you very much. You guys did a great job. Board Member Pritchett. Thank you. Uh, first off, I was wondering if you could tell me the meeting date again. April 17. 3 to 5. 3 to 5. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Second, I just kind of wanted to go back to uh, Jessica Ariaga's comment about um, the communication in the schools and um, and and talking about the students' overall well-being. This is great research. I know that you guys have a lot on your plate moving forward um, and a, a long road ahead. But um, one of the reasons why I became so involved and decided to actually run for, for school board was because of communications within the schools. And I was one of those fed up parents of, I'm going to do something about this. Um, so I would like to know, with the information that you've gathered, what's the next step look like um, as far as not just chronic absences, but working with the schools and having those teachers reach out to the parents to find out why, why they're out? <clears throat> Without going into a lot of detail, um, this is just a copy of our draft work plan, and it begins to address some of those issues. Um, and that's the building capacity. Um, so it, that's, it, we're going to be developing that on how do we get this information. One is around just even the definitions of what Eddie, Eddie was talking about. What does chronic absence mean, and how do we do that outreach? Because teachers frequently are the ones who are Seen, you know, I've seen the children and can be reaching out to the parents. So they're going to pay, play a pivotal role in being able to identify the students as well as doing uh, targeted outreach to the families. But a lot of this is going to be developed because one of the things we want to be doing is engaging the, the teachers in this, like through the home visitation program. Yes. That's going to, we're working with um, Carrie Rose right now, and, and Hetty is also on trying to alter the, their curriculum just a little bit so that they begin to address chronic absence when they go out to the home visits so that they learn what that definition is and they understand what that impact can be and how can we support them if that becomes an issue. So those are teachers that are going out doing that. So that's one way. But they're, 
there's a lot of detail in this, and I would love for you to come to the meeting. And there also, I wanted to mention there will be other meetings as well, because we're not going to be able to target all parents and community members from 3 to 5, so there'll be some additional meetings so we can make sure we kind of get as many people as possible engaged in this process to review this and get their input. I'm glad that you mentioned the current teacher home visit project because that was the next bullet point on my list <laughs> to make sure that you guys are involved with them. Um, good. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the outcome and working with you guys. I'm the board member that sits on the uh, parent teacher home visit project, so I look forward to the to the work ahead of us. Vice President Wu. Thank you, President Cuneo. I just had a, one one clarifying question. I love the work that's going on, and I look forward for its outcome and the ability to um, uh, intervene with um, the children who uh, really need some assistance, and then we can be able to target that. But in terms of your definitions of um, of uh, truancy and, and chronic absenteeism, are you counting entire days of schools school missed? In in other words, it, we we heard uh, Miss Area. Uh, uh, talk about her son having to go to uh, um, medical appointments, for example. And she would bring her, her child back to school after the medical appointment. Um, it would seem to me then that if you're missing 10% um, of the school year, you're talking about 10% of an entire, uh, um, the total number of minutes at school, which means to me 10% of all the day. So that if you come to uh, if you come and miss f f first period or the first two hours of school, you're not cons uh, that's considered an excused absence, and you're not cons uh, the child then is not considered a chronic absentee. Is that correct? I can uh, so first of all. The, the Do you mind stepping uh, to the microphone? Yeah. Um, Chronic absence includes excused and unexcused absences. I'm not trying to make a difference. And it's not meant to pass judgment. It's meant to just say, has a kid, it, it's not truancy, which is unexcused absence, triggers legal intervention. Chronic absence is just trying to look at, have you missed so much time for any reason that we need to check in what's going on? Not, it's, it's a flag for maybe additional outreach as opposed to trying to move folks into a legal system. This is, bit different. In terms of period, so there's a difference, I think, in, in Sacramento. There's a it, it has to do with data systems. If you're a kid in elementary school, usually elementary schools are looking at whole day attendance. So if a child comes in late, they would still be considered there for that whole day, even if they came in late. When you talk, I, do you guys do period attendance? I think at the middle and high school. Um, and at that point, um, you, you actually have to start adding up periods. Now, it's also true if a kid misses 10% of every single, um, you know, algebra class that they're in, they're going to have a really hard time passing algebra. So um, when you move into something like um, school um, on track uh, California, that will actually allow you to trigger, look at the data more finely. This actually is a question about your data system and your data capacities to look at that. And then I would also say, again, the truancy system is different. They have definitions based on late and tardiness and um, uh, uh, unexcused absence that are based upon state law that is actually not subject to whatever you, I mean, it's, it's just not um, locally determined. Hopefully that answers your question. Well, I, I think that what I, the important thing that I heard was that it is a factor to flag to see whether or not intervention is necessary. Um, it is not a, um, a determinative outcome that this particular student um, um, is, it's not, it sh ought not necessarily be a, uh, a negative um, um, fact, uh, a negative um, identifier with that child. Absolutely. And actually, you want to look for systems. If you see, for example, that all of the kids from a particular neighborhood, which you might find, cannot get to the school. It probably means you either have a safe path or a transportation issue, or maybe you have an uh, unaffordable housing issue. Once you see systemic patterns, what you need to do is use that as a trigger to understand and figure out programmatic barriers. 
So that the point of this data isn't even always to just look at individual kit issues. It's to allow you to identify when you have something that requires a bigger solution. Let me give one little example. In Providence, they had all these chronically absent kids at one elementary school. When they talked to the parents, what they realized is the parents were all working the night shift, falling asleep before they could get the kids to school. What they ended up creating was a free um, a early morning breakfast um, early care program so the parents could drop their kids off to school before they fell asleep exhausted from their nighttime jobs. This is why if you can look at it, look at programmatic, you can come up with better solutions. It's not about a punitive action towards individuals, which is what attendance has typically been used to. We have to change that frame. Thank you. Board Member Hanson. Thank you. Just uh, a couple questions. Um, and I'm, I looked you know, through the data, and I was wondering, if, or, even though anecdotally, I'd imagine that students that miss school at an early age are more likely to continue to have absence problems as time goes on. Is that is that true, or do we have enough data here to know? Or mm -hmm. yeah. more broadly. <laughs> I, I, I am sorry. I don't see me jumping up and down. Please. From national data, I know kids who are chronically absent in kindergarten and you follow them six years later are more likely to do worse in fifth grade if they're in poverty because kids in poverty tend to have less resources to make up for the la lost time and more likelihood to be chronically absent multiple years because they're facing barriers like poor, uh, poor transportation, housing, lack of access to health care. In Oakland, we did an analysis where we looked at first grade kids' first grade chronic absence and what happened to them in sixth grade. If you were chronically absent one year in first grade, you were about five times more likely to be chronically absent in sixth grade, had poor um, test scores and higher suspensions. If you were two years in elementary, it was about eight times higher chronic absence. If there was three years of chronic absence in elementary school, it was 18 times higher levels of chronic absence by sixth grade. If we can't interrupt the cycle, if kids don't or miss so much school, they can't they don't have the opportunity to learn to read by fourth grade when they have to read to learn, and school's not a positive place for them. It becomes a negative issue. Mm -hmm. And so the, sh the issue is we've got to use this data to provide positive supports so we're not paying costly co remediation, and we can't figure out a way to help the kid by the time they're in middle and high school. Mm -hmm. That's great information. Thank you. Uh, and then did we look at, do we know how much of the chronic absence or how much, how much of the absences were excused absences? So, I mean, did we, I mean, of the, of the data that we did for our school district for our yeah, one. Yeah, unfortunately for that year, they weren't able to give me the breakdown so that I could look at, you know, which percentage of the chronic absences were excused versus unexcused. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we hope to be able to look at down the road. Makes sense. And then, you know, just a, just a couple of just comments then. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that information. But I know that the state's looking to develop its new SPI scores. Uh, maybe the district, you know, we might consider asking the state to make absences part of the SPI scores for districts. I think that certainly brings a heightened attention to uh, absences and encourages us, as, as we're doing, and other districts to address something that's so serious. Jay, um, I wanted to mention that I know that they are looking at changing the API. Is that what you're mentioning? And actually, chronic absence is one of the indicators that they're looking to add into that 40% of, of other, than, to other than test scores. So chronic absence it happens to be on that list. Good. Well, maybe so, and there's a hearing coming up. I can ask uh, our president and superintendent for us to talk about whether that's something we'd want to support uh, sending a note of encouragement that we would support adding that as part of the criteria. It certainly seems that the data is bearing it out that this is something that should be looked at, and I'm glad that, you know, that we're being proactive. I'd also like to say that obviously this is a kind of great project that gives all of us the opportunity, you know, the folks that come to all the board meetings, the folks that are watching on TV and all of us, uh, a project to work on that's going to help students, it's going to help parents, it's going to help the district. 
And uh, as I will relentlessly mention, you know, instead of having to focus on the tough things and the negative things, which I know we're, is going to happen, and I'm not going to be a Pollyanna about that, that we're never going to hear those kind of comments because that's appropriate. But I always like to encourage people, too, that when we can find some positive things to work on, like this issue and jumping in, it's a great opportunity for all of us to do that. I encourage people to do that. I know the board is going to be working on that as well. And then lastly, uh, I've been very impressed with our district's work at our home visit program. I just would like to compliment the staff and the district on the work on that. I know we've conducted several thousand just in this last year. And I would just have to imagine that as we collect more information, that home visit programs are the exact kind of things that, you know, one of the things that are going to help us curb this problem to understand and being able to work with parents and try to address that issue head on. So thank you very much for the report. Board member Rodriguez. Thank you, President Cunha. <clears throat> well, this, frankly put, um, your maps and information would have been a very good um, piece of information for this board to have had before the decision to close schools would have um, come before us because your map absolutely perfectly overlies where we close schools. And so the issue of absenteeism probably won't get better. Um, but <clears throat> with that said, you know, we're looking at negative identifiers. Um, one of them is the way we classify um, students as chronically absent. Um, that is, um, and, it, and it's been said over and over up here, it's not meant to be punitive. Um, but when you have a title like that, it's punitive uh, because they're chronically underperforming, they're chronically tardy, chronically absent. Anything with the word chronic in front of it is going to be punitive. So um, I think we need to change our language, and hopefully that will come um, through the study and as a result of talking to people. Um, what I see here is, um, you know, desktop analysis done at its finest. You know, you've identified poverty and um, the impacts of what poverty looks like on a community. Um, good. And so, but remember, you still have to talk and understand um, the people who are experiencing this issue. And um, once you do so, then it allows you for, to, uh, to assess what their needs are, thereby creating um, or helping us to create a policy or a policy change in which to uh, make a positive impact on the community in which we're, we're studying, um, in which we're trying to affect, because that's really what our jobs are here to do. Um, we're looking at policy, and um, when it's implemented, how does it affect that community? And um, when we make policy to close schools because of the fiscal um, reason, we're not really looking at what the community is experiencing. We're looking at this from this very high level instead of going down to where the issues are existing and bringing those forward and saying, I think we have an issue here. We need to talk to the people. We need to come back with a resolution according to their needs. Because I, I, I don't know about anybody else or any other elected official, um, but I am one that listens to people. So um, great start. Fantastic start. You identified the impacts to a community that is experiencing poverty. I await to hear what they say as a whole. Not just a few people, not a task force, but as a whole. And I would hope that if you do surveys, that the, the number of expected response is going to be higher than 50% of the people who are experiencing, I, I, in your d very dark areas, one of them happens to be mine. And so, you know, I wanna see that response rate very high in those areas, because then that would indicate to me that you did your outreach and you did your homework. Um, so so I, ex I, I anticipate for you to come forward to us with the second half of this report. I wanna thank Ms. Chronic. I know you came here before and you presented this as a concept and um, I was excited to hear about it. So um, great next step. 
um, but I want to see the next step even be better and, and more greater than this. Thank you. Board Member Pritchett. <clears throat> Thank you, President Cuno. Real, real quickly, I just wanted to also mention, I was writing the date down on my calendar, and it kind of came to me that you said you were going to have additional meetings. Will we be having meetings in the evening that parents can attend when they're off work? Uh, we recognize that three to five isn't going to, we're not going to get to everybody that way, so it's just our first one. To get to okay. To okay. Yeah. Thank you. I can ask. Um, there was a oh, board member Rodriguez. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I wanted to um, get a question. Somebody mentioned um, state statute about absenteeism or what the definition is. Um, do you happen to have that off, off the top of your head? or it's under the state compulsory ed law. And by the way, just so you know, truancy is defined totally different by every single state. So it doesn't mean the same thing anywhere you go. Um, but it's um, any, a child is truant if they miss uh, three days without a valid excuse or are late to class three times by 30 minutes makes a child truant. And then what happens if a child has, is identified truant three times, then um, they have to have a student attendance review team. And if, that and if the truancy continues, then that's when it triggers a SARB. Chronic absence right now, the only state statute that is, is um, one that just defines is it missing 10% or more of school because we tried to, um, so in California, the longitudinal student data system, CalPADS, does not actually have attendance in it. So we can't, from the state level, calculate chronic absence. And there was a definition put in law by a group of advocates when we were trying to see if we could add attendance into the state database. Do you have a... Do you happen to know the codes on those? Or? I do not have that memorized. I'm sorry. Um, I'm certainly we can get it back uh, to okay. folks and do it that way, but I, that one evades my memory. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate the presentation, appreciate the report, and appreciate your ability to tackle a difficult issue. Um, nice to see Mr. Allen Lang. Always uh, respected and admired your work, and I'm glad to see you at the table for this. I did have a question. We are piloting, I think this is for Mr. McPierce, we are actually piloting or implementing some strategies at this moment, and I was wondering um, what those strategies are and how's it going. Piloting on track California software program uh, designed to help us with early detection. Um, and it, in its roughest form, it's actually designed to increase communication at the school level, at the school side between the school staff. And so if, you, if, if it targets a student and it identifies a student as chronically absent, um, what, what, it, what it does is now initiates a, a response of, of, of communication between the principal, the teachers themselves. If you have a school counselor or a school nurse, now we need to, to, to basically talk about, about, some, about, about the issue of the student and, and foster some type of ideas that will create some type of solution to the problem. And so that's what's taking place at that level with on track. We're piloting it with six schools. Uh, three, uh, three of the high schools, Science and Engineering, West Campus, and Science and Engineering, oh, excuse me, two high schools, Science and Engineering, West Campus, three middle schools, Wolfsey Wood, Rosa Parks, and Kid Carson, and one elementary school, Elder Creek. How's it going? Uh, so far, it's going good. Uh, it's now, the, the, the data is now uh, collected correctly. And so the schools now look at their live data every day that is, the, that is collected by Zango. It reads on top of Zango. And so it makes the data collection a lot easier for principals to look at. And so when a principal goes to school the next day, he can log into his computer and actually have a list of students that have been flagged uh, as uh, students to look at based on whatever criteria they've created. Um, and so, for instance, if, they, if the principal has set that he wants to see a, a particular student flagged that has missed two days this week. He'll list all of the students when he logs in the next day to see those students. And then basically from that information, then disseminate a plan within the school to talk to those kids about those issues. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I just want to know the timeline on this. Are, are you proposing to come back to the board when we've kind of decided on some strategies to use and discuss those? Or, or what, what's your thinking about board involvement? And can you use the microphone, please? 
<laughs> it's not my for my benefit. It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, it might be useful for us to come back to share the work plan after we it's been vetted through you know with all the different groups. That way, you know kind of what the what the real next steps are in terms of how we're going to be implementing different things. Um, or we could wait and see what the next year data how the next data rolls in. So it's up up to the board in terms of what you want to. I, yeah, we can talk about that offline. I okay. mean, I am interested in, in, in the strategies that are, are devised and kind of the efficacy of those strategies, a discussion about that at some point. Okay. Uh, when you think it is a good point to have that. Okay, discussion. sounds great. We'll, we'll make sure we do that. All right, well, I appreciate everybody's hard work. Thank you very much. <laughs> On to item uh, 10.2, resolution number 2740. Approving the transfer of Mark Hopkins students to Rosa Parks and the reconfiguration of Rosa Parks as a K through eight school. It's a conference and action item, a fifteen minute presentation and a fifteen minute discussion. Superintendent Raymond. Uh, thank you, President Cuneo. Sarah Noguchi and um, accompanied by several of our principals and um, community members and parents uh, will present on this next item. Oh, will not hurt you. Good evening, President Cuneo, uh, members of the board, thank you, and Superintendent Raymond. My name is Sarah Noguchi, and I'm here with a host of folks um, that is going to support us in our understanding of information that's been gained from our community outreach relative to a re the reconfiguration of Rosa Parks. We're here tonight to ask for approval for a grade configuration change for Rosa Parks to a K-8 school. The impetus for this request began during a community meeting back in February. At this meeting, parents asked the district to consider moving Rosa Parks to a K-8 configuration. Working with this idea, we first began to take a look at the capacity of the facility to see if it was fe actually feasible to move all the students over to Rosa Parks, and we did, in fact, find that there was plenty of capacity. We then began community outreach and community input from both communities, both Mark Hopkins and also Rosa Parks. Tonight you will hear from both parents and staff about the benefits they believe will result in the reconfiguration. And with that, I introduce Dr. Smith Simmons from Mark Hopkins. Good evening, I am Tiffany Smith Simmons, the principal at Mark Hopkins. As we embraced the idea that our school was closed, we began holding several community meetings in which we worked together to gather input from our community members. We offered both morning and evening sessions to accommodate varied schedules for our families. Given our current options, the community really has come to see the benefits of converting Rosa Parks to a K-8 model. The parents are excited about the opportunity about remaining in their neighborhood. They are happy that not only can their children stay together through the K-8 experience, but the families that we know as the Mark Hopkins families are able to stay together as well. They're also most excited because it was their idea when they asked the, the staff if they would consider it being a K-8 model. Tonight, I brought with me three parents, Ms. Aguilar, Ms. Gentle, and Mr. Ortiz. He serves many roles. He's actually one of our instructional aides as well. First, Ms. Aguilar. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, um, board members and Superintendent Raymond. My name is Gabriela Aguilar. I'm a parent of second and sixth grade in what will have been an incoming kindergarten at Mar Hopkins. I'm also here tonight to share my thoughts regarding the Rosa Park turning into KA. I ask you to really consider voting yes on this proposal because it is really the best option for our family, limited resources. <clears throat> All that I considered with open enrollment for my family. I know that having the provided transportation on a daily basis for their, for their kids is not really many, excuse me, 
our family knows. Many of our family have limited resources. I personally believe the walk to either location, John Sloat or John Bewell, represent hardship to our families with limited resources. Thank you for listening to me and hear our concerns about alternative, <coughs> the alternative if you do not make Rosa Park a K through A. Thank you. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Raymond. I am Patricia Gentle, and I'm a parent of a second grader at Mark Hopkins and also what would have been an incoming preschooler. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am here tonight to share my thoughts regarding the conversation of Rosa Parks Middle School converting into a K-8. As you may recall, but when we were faced with the idea of possibly closing Mark Hopkins, it was me who had asked about this possibility. Under the direction of our principal, Dr. Simmons, we formed a parent empowerment group. She has said over and over, in fact, each greeting she sends ends with in partnership. She believes partnerships between homes and schools are what make successful students. So I stand here before you tonight excited that you are considering the idea I vocalized at our community meeting. <laughs> the idea of Rosa Parks converting to a K-8 is the best possible solution for our families. I attended the parent informational meeting and I was happy to hear about all of the services offered at Rosa Parks. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabriel Ortiz. And um, I've been with uh, Mark Hopkins for 12 years. And uh, the last uh, three or four years, I've been uh, very involved in the, in the school. And uh, the last couple months, was, it was, uh, we've seen the darkest hour in the school, knowing that it was going to be closed. But at the end of the tunnel, there's a shining line, shining light, very little one, and it's uh, Rosa Parks. And that makes us very excited, not just uh, the staff, but the parents, they 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 happy about it. Uh, move to Rosa Parks. We've been with Rosa Parks many years. We celebrate uh, Christmas, African American uh, month, Hispanic month. So it's like uh, we always, we belong together. So please uh, consider this, this option. Is, 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 I think it's the best for the uh, Mark Hopkins community. That's including the, the teachers and the parents. Uh, and it's the best for, for the children too. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Robert Sullivan. I'm principal at Rosa Parks Middle School. This is my second year. Uh, we, too, uh, met with our stakeholders, our staff, um, our school site council, ELAC, um, our parents, and then a, a joint meeting uh, held at our campus with the Mark Hopkins parents. Um, everybody is, seems to be very excited. I have not heard any negative things from parents. Everybody seems to be on board with it. Um, but there's three things that kind of been uh, a thread throughout all of these meetings. And one of them is it keeps the kids in the community. I I've heard that over and over. Uh, one parent um, expressed to me that it's the blending of two families. Uh, it's bringing the Mark Hopkins family together along with the Rosa Parks family and now putting them under one roof, which I think is a positive thing. Also the safety aspect, uh, the kids walking to school, uh, they're familiar with walking to Mark Hopkins. We're simply next door. Their, their concerns were walking to John Sloat or John Bidwell. And then finally, the stability of the students. Um, having a student from kindergarten all the way through eighth grade really um, builds relationships between the community, the families, and the school. And uh, everybody was really excited throughout the whole process. I also brought a couple of uh, our parents. Um, the, we have uh, Ms. Corson and also uh, Ms. Walters will be speaking too. Hi, my name is Glenda Coopson. 
My son attended Rosa Parks 2010 to 2012, and he's a freshman at Kennedy High School. My daughter is currently a seventh grader at Rosa Parks and will be attending eighth grade if you guys make this school a K through eight. Mr. Sullivan has been with our family for over six years. He was my daughter's principal at another elementary school. Also, Mr. Sullivan is an awesome principal and he has made significant changes here at Rosa Parks. He has a great staff that makes the kids feel welcome and safe coming to school. I will be here next year if Rosa Parks changes to a K through eight. I'm excited, looking forward to the change since it will benefit all the kids in every grade who attends here. The older kids can be great role models and mentor to the younger kids in the older and being a buddy system. They will make kids become more responsible and supportive of each other. I have been with Rosa Parks for two years, well, three years, and with also two years because of my daughter. He, Mr. Sullivan has been, and his staff has been at Rosa Parks, and they have made it very exciting, to. Ch and I'm looking forward to the change from K through 8. Hi, my name is Mary Walters, and I have a student at uh, Rosa Parks. He's been there for two years. This is his last year. And I have a sixth grader going to be attending next year. My son, when he first was going to Rosa Parks, was when the change went over and Mr. Sullivan started there. And I was very worried and upset with him, with his special needs and stuff, and people teasing him and things happening at school. Mr. Sullivan and his staff have done a wonderful job inspiring my son into feeling more, um, how do you say, he's matured a lot in the last two years. He's changed, he's became more responsible, he has a bigger outlet on himself. There's a lot of difference in my son in the two years. I'm looking forward to my sixth grader coming to Rosa Parks next year. I know that uh, Mr. Sullivan is a grace principal as far as a junior high level principal and an elementary school principal. He was my children's elementary school uh, principal for years. Um, I started out with my son with him in kindergarten. I know that the kids from Mark Hopkins will be able to benefit a lot from him and his staff. The children there will feel loved and will get a great education. Bringing the two schools together will also allow the children to feel more encouraged to be there because their bigger sibling will be there. They won't be afraid. The older siblings will be able to achieve their goals because they're not going to be worried about whether or not their little brother or sister made it all the way over to one of the other two schools or them having to walk them all the way over and then get to Rosa Parks and be late for their own classes. So them joining together and becoming one school would make a great benefit for the kids and the community in this area because parents worry a lot about their children, and especially nowadays our children have to go to school on their own in the morning, a lot of children, because their parents work. Because this time and age, you have, it's a two-parent household. It's not a single-parent household. And you, both parents are out working. Most of them want to work during the day while the kids are in school so that they're home in the evening and being able to help them with their homework and just be part of their lives. And with that, them having to walk further for school and the older children having to be responsible for that, it just puts a bigger burden on the bigger kids. Their grades are going to lag, and the little kids are going to be more nervous and worried in a strange environment. So I just think it would be a great thing for both schools and for the children and the parents of the community. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Cynthia Hart and I'm the site instruction coordinator at Rosa Parks. Over the course of the meetings with the staff and the community, various academic benefits for the students and staff were also mentioned. One such benefit is vertical articulation and collaboration. By having teachers from kindergarten through eighth grade on the same campus, we can begin to align our curriculum and academic program, thus ensuring our students are well prepared for the next grade level. 
This is going to be especially important as we move into the Common Core standards. We will know where students need to be when they leave us for high school and backward map how they will get there. A second benefit is that students will have an authentic audience for tasks. For example, if a seventh grade student is learning how to use a microscope in their science class, instead of just having a class objective that the student is to learn how to use a microscope, the objective could now be that the student will be going to our third grade classrooms to teach the third graders how to use a microscope. The amount and types of tasks that could be created using an authentic audience could be built into the K-8 school would be endless. Another benefit is the availability of mentoring and buddy rooms. The older kids could mentor, read to, tutor, write to the younger students, and vice versa. We could have writing buddies during interactive journaling, students editing each other's work from various grade levels, or service learning projects going on within the campus, again, with an authentic audience. The possibilities are endless. And finally, a benefit that was discussed was the increased sense of belonging and community that would be created and felt by the students. Stronger relationships may develop between students, between teachers, between students and teachers, and between parents and teachers. So next steps, should you um, vote should you vote to approve this um, recommendation, we would, we would convene a transition team, which would include a variety of stakeholders from both communities, including ELAC, PTA, community members, teachers, parents, administrators, board members, if that, if that is an interest of yours. During this transition team, there's a variety of different things that, that we would tackle. Um, and I won't go through the, the, the list of um, activities there or different topics there. But I'll just take the first one, safety. So safety is all-encompassing. And bringing two schools together, there's a lot of things to consider. First, traffic patterns. Where should the kids come in and go out of school? When should they come and when should they go, given the traffic patterns and, um, the, commu and the community at the time? So that's something, one thing that they'll be looking at. They'll also be looking at program designs, um, blending activities. What does that look like when they're coming together over the summer? Um, September, October, November, bringing parents together, bringing the community together. All of that will be discussed once and if you decide and vote on um, this recommendation. So at this time, we are um, open to questions after public comment. Um, I hope that you did have the opportunity to hear the benefits from parents and staff um, relative to the reconfiguration, reconfiguration of the K-8. Thank you very much. I think we'll have uh, public comment. We have one public comment from Leo Bennett Cochon. Good evening. My name is Leo Bennett Cochon, and I look forward to a vigorous discussion. My children have attended both K-8 schools and middle schools. You are not being asked to create a K-8 school. You're being asked to create something I can find no evidence in the educational literature, a K-6 school that is co-housed with the middle school. You will have students who are in sixth grade with 50 students, moving up to seventh grade with over 200 students. Where's the data? that shows that can give you the benefits of a K-8 school. Many of the benefits that have been stated, I've experienced in a K-8 school. Again, I've never heard of an educational model that co-houses K-6 students on a middle school campus with 400 7th and 8th graders from many different neighborhoods. The key was given current options. Give the community additional options. It's an F to close Mark Hopkins, and perhaps it's a D to move them to Rosa Parks. Most people that are looking to reconfigure move students from the middle school to the K-6 school, because it's not a big jump. We're supposed to be in a fiscal crisis, and yet your proposal states that you're going to remodel without any cost figures. Mark Hopkins was a $41,000 deficit. That's all in only revenue limit fund. It's in surplus when you add other funds. So why we're even doing this completely escapes me. It states that you're going to move playground equipment, remodel existing classrooms. Again, 
for what purpose? It states you're going to lose 24 students because you're relocating them. This district has looked at these options before. This is an ideal site if you feel you need to save administrative costs. Leave the students in place and have your administrative reduced team walk back and forth on the same site. I would consider that to be a viable, I mean, a viable option. Your facilities master plan to wrap it up addresses transportation issues. It disagrees with your quality report and says that the frontage is not adequate, that it's too much traffic, it's unsafe conditions, and now we're all going to be at one drop-off point. Again, to me, the logic is keep them at the two sites and figure out a more cost-effective and student-first approach. They deserve better than a D option. Thank you. Board Member Pritchett. Thank you, President Cuno. Uh, just so I completely understand and grasp this, it, <laughs> can, you can, okay. I'm sure. <laughs> um, Mark Hopkins is uh, a K-6, mm -hmm. and Rosa Parks is a 7th, 8th? Yes. And um, can you tell me if the majority of the students from Mark Hopkins currently, at, they automatically feed right into Rosa Parks? Yes, that's their home middle school. That's their home middle school. Okay. And um, you were stating about capacity and that there was plenty of capacity. Do you know what the capacity level is there? You know, I don't have that number directly in front of me. If I'm remembering correctly, the capacity was roughly, um, it could house a little over 2,000 kids. Um, currently, there's 400 kids, 450 kids approximately in, um, in Mark Hopkins. There was basically 800 spots left over even after uh, moving it together. I don't have those specific numbers, but I can get those for you. And, and can you tell me, like, how many actual empty classrooms there were? Because I know during the closure process there was a lot of confusion on what was actual teachable space. So I'm just wondering how many actual empty classrooms are there at Rosa Parks to be able to house these elementary school kids? I don't know exactly the number of empty classrooms, but I do know that we've sat down with the number of classrooms that are over at Mark Hopkins and the number of classrooms that will be needed for the 7-8 um, next year, um, in addition to some special education classrooms that we have, preschool that's also being um, proposed, and obviously the kinders that are going to come in. Bobby and I sat, worked through all of that in addition to um, facilities going in and looking at all those options. And even as of today, there was another meeting um, looking at capacity numbers, and they, they, do have, they do have the capacity. Is there some work that needs to be done? The answer is absolutely yes. There's some um, classrooms that need different carpeting. There's some classrooms that need painting. There's some classrooms that need some refurbishing. Um, in addition, um, we're looking at moving two portables um, from... Mark Hopkins um, over to Rosa Parks, one of which is something that Mark Hopkins, it came out of a community meeting, I think it's, it was the breakfast meeting, um, where the parents said, you know, the Maloofs and the Sacramento Kings put together this, um, this uh, classroom for us, and it's very much deep in our kind of culture and our, and, and our hearts, is there a way of moving that over to Rosa Parks? And so that is something that's also being considered in um, the move. Now I have to say we haven't delved deeply into all the specifics, because the reality is the board hasn't voted on, um, on on a reconfiguration. This right now is all just up in drafts and concept at this point. So specifics, a lot of folks have been asking for specifics. A lot of parents have been wanting answers. But because we haven't done the transition team, we don't have those answers because we are not that far down the road, not as far as some of the other schools, because we haven't started that process yet because we're waiting for the board's action. But we for sure know that if we take action tonight to make this change, that they're going to be able to accommodate these yes, students Yes, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, can you tell me what the capacity is in the cafeteria and if um, they're going to be able to accommodate all the students with lunch service? Um, you know, I'm going to open that up to Bobby because I'm um, Mr. Sullivan because he does have um, experience with that cafeteria. I know it is a large cafeteria. I don't know exactly the square footage. Certainly we can get the capacity numbers for all the rooms and, and all the um, square footage over there for you. But I can have Mr. Sullivan speak to that. I don't think that's necessary. I just, oh. but 
I mean, no, no, not with him. Sorry, with what you were saying with the square footage. Sorry, not you. Know, you know. So I don't, but with I, the square footage, because we're I don't know the action tonight. Footage. I'm just trying to get answers now so I yeah. can make a sound decision. So. Just a couple of things. When this was first brought to my attention, um, they had to prove to me that there was capacity for Mark Hopkins to come over because I had some doubts because it seems like we're full. And I walk these halls every day, every minute. And, but in walking around the campus, there is room to house. There's approximately 400 students at Mark Hopkins. We have approximately 470. There is room to bring that school over comfortably to where everybody can fit together without any problem. The cafeteria is big enough. I'm not sure the exact capacity number, uh, but it's big enough to hold three lunches and hold the school. It, 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 that, that's not a problem. But you're not going to have to start lunches at like 9.45 Absolutely in the morning. Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> both myself, myself and Miss Hart were at uh, John Still when it was 10 years ago when it was a K-8, and it's very similar number-wise. And we did run three lunches, and we didn't have to start at 9 o'clock. That part could all work. It's the same facility. But it's the same exact facility. But all that kind of stuff, these are the same questions that we got from the parents and, and teachers and myself. Um, that would come out of the transition team. But the capacity-wise, definitely could work. Okay. And my uh, other question is, uh, maybe the superintendent can answer this one. Um, as far as cost, I know we talked about uh, repairs and moving equipment and all that. Do you know uh, approximately how much this move would cost and where would this money would come from? Can you talk to the cost, Ms. Noguchi? Actually, I can't speak to the cost, but I do. Um, I did have a conversation with Ms. Cummings earlier around the cost at this point um, because there's still some things that need to be worked out um, regarding um, the cost of the, the movement of um, the portables and exactly what in the classrooms would need to be changed. That still has to be put together as far as the cost. Unless, did you have anything additional? With the cost of the move over to Rosa Parks, there are some upgrades that we're doing, but those are needed no, regardless if we close Mark Hopkins and move the kids or not. It's all a part of our sustainable facility master plan. The cost to move the portable over is approximately 75000 And wh And where would that money come from? Do we know? It's bond money. Thank you. Um, going back to the lunch service, I'm sorry, that's a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> um, I, you were saying that you can do three lunches. You're not going to be having first graders or kindergartners eating with eighth graders, right? You'll be um, able to. No, ma'am, that, that wouldn't happen. It, you, uh, again, these are things that have come out, but the way that I've been thinking about it in, in my head and done it before is there's a first through third grade lunch. Four, five, six lunch, and a seven, eight lunch. But again, that wouldn't be my decision. That would come out of the transition team. Okay. And then my last question is, uh, what will happen with the facilities of Mark Hopkins? So that's the 7-Eleven process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Board Member Rodriguez. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, from uh, Mark Hopkins and uh, Rosa Parks. Um, and thank you for your time for coming today. Um, thank you to the parents, especially. And um, you know, I, I, it, I was up here actually almost going to cry. Um, not because I'm happy. I'm very sad. Extremely sad. Um, something that was said, and it actually was picked up by a member of the public, given the current options. You know, if I were a parent, I'd have to go along with this too. I'd probably have to read from a script as well, um, because I want to look out for the best interest of my child. Um, so it makes me sad to hear this. Um, given the current options. I liken it to being on a pirate ship and the captain of the ship has got you on the plank and they give you the option, you're going to either go over with a blindfold or you're not. But either way, you're going over that plank. So it's not a good option. Um, and I'll tell you why. We're closing a school and combining two schools without a plan 
it's a little backwards here. We have three elementary schools in that area, and Mr. Sullivan, you were principal of one of those. And I know you've seen your students at uh, Rosa Parks. And so we have schools that um, they are in that area that are either increasing enrollment or decreasing in enrollment. Um, we have to, we did fail to do a study of that neighborhood to find out why, what's going on. And so, um, you know, I ask you this one question, and I hope that you do have the answer. Is Mark Hopkins' enrollment increasing or decreasing? Can you say that, please, in the microphone? It, it doesn't have to be the principal. Thank you, Ms. Tiffany. It's increasing, and the thoughts, because we've talked about this at School Site Council, we believe it was because of the development of the enrollment center, because students and families were actually directed to their home school, because there are so many schools nearby. Thank you. Was there a study done on the birth rates in that area? I don't know of a study done with the birth rates in sex in, in, the, in that specific area. Not in that specific area, I'm not aware of any. Okay, so again, we're not using a plan to do this. Um, you know, we don't have a plan for what's going to happen with the Mark Hopkins facility at this point. Um, a facility that has experience, in, you know, some renovations, that actually the district didn't pay for, that was in the kindness of community that came forward. You know, the Kings donated a significant amount of time and energy and respect to that school. And we're showing back to the community that, well, we don't really care. We're going to close it anyway. We don't even have a plan for it because we still have to commit, you know, we still have to establish a committee out there. Um, I think better planning could have been done here on this one. I think that this is not a good option. In addition to that, um, the fiscal considerations, I, I think as board members, please know that it is our fiduciary responsibility uh, up here to make prudent financial decisions on the behalf of our taxpayers who pay, pay into our district. Um, and we went out and we asked them uh, to fund bonds. We asked for their permission. And let me just break it down to you like this in an adult way that everyone can understand. If you're a homeowner and you want to do home improvements on your house, but you don't have the funds readily available, you can go and take a second out on your house. And so base, and to do those improvements. So basically what the district did, our board decided to do, was go out to the homeowners of the community and ask them to take out a second mortgage on their home to do, to do home improvements on their schools, their neighborhood schools. And yet we closed their neighborhood schools, the voters. And in fact, I think Area 5 was the one that was polling the highest of passing measures Q&R. And now we're closing their school. So um, now, this, those homeowners are stuck with that note. They are going to pay taxes on that house no matter what. Those, they're going to pay taxes on it. This is disturbing to me as a board member when we get a packet that says the total project cost and scope not yet determined, and you're asking for us, the board, to approve a resolution to go forward with this plan. That's something I cannot support, and I hope, I hope that other board members say no to this tonight and ask for the real numbers of how this is going to cost. Because we just went out there in good faith to the public and asked them to vote on measures Q and R. And I'll tell you an example of how this is concerning. I got an email today just so timely, and it's about the federal government saying that the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board just passed new rules requiring bankers who buy and sell municipal bonds to disclose the contributions they make to public bond campaigns. That's a new rule that passed today at the federal government level, because if you read further into this article, there's a lot of stuff that happens with school boards at the school board level with a lot of vendors coming and trying to get school boards to get them to place loans out there. 
because they just had a meeting the other night, a workshop, just last night. But nobody talked about the back end of how somebody gets paid on those, placing those loans out there. I used to do loans. I know how it works. And I know that when you're looking at millions of dollars and you're placing it out there, that there's something to gain on the back end for the person who's placing those loans. There's also something called a yield spread premium who somebody is going to benefit even more so on those. This is why these rules are being passed at the federal level. We cannot afford to be fiscally imprudent on this board. I hope that we don't make another poor decision up here and that we start putting our foot down and saying we want the facts. Over and over, I've heard a person before us say, I don't have the answer to you, for you. We have to make sure that we're making well-informed decisions. I've never seen this. My child has gone to a K-8 through model. One first grade, one second grade, one third grade. The class sizes were no more than 30, 35. In each grade all the way up to eighth grade. So I know K-8 through model. This is not a K through eight model. How could you call it a K through eight model? If you're gonna do something innovative, at least call it something different. This is not a K through eight model. And I, I'm with Mr. Sullivan, I, I just can't see how this school, given what I've heard about capacity calculations for the other seven schools, the other six schools that were decided on, I, I, I am very concerned about that. Um, the issue about children walking from other, sc other schools with their siblings. Again, I'm going to point to doing a study in the area. Maybe a different school deserves to be looked at. And then we can make a plan. And that's what I've been talking about this whole time. We have to go and look at a plan. And I was willing to stand behind a community and getting down, down to the facts and a study and looking at what we could do. But this is backwards, and I'm not in favor of it. Vice President Wu. Thank you, President Cuneo. Ms. Noguchi, we've heard a lot of positive things that you've presented to us about um, uh, turning Rosa Parks into a K through eight. Did you guys, um, as a group, when you're analyzing this, did you come across um, or identify for yourselves any negatives that, that might arise out of the, this project? I can give you my perspective and then I will ask the two principals because they obviously facilitated all of the meetings. I was at many of them, but I can certainly give you my perspective. At the meetings, for the most part, many of them came already with it in mind that it was going to happen. And so the meeting started out with, so what are we going to do with the playground and what are we going to do with the bathrooms for the kinders? And they were already down the road. And so both principals in the meetings, they would go back to, remember, this isn't a done deal. Um, let's, what are the positives, negatives, those sorts of things. So they tried to bring it back to that, but parents the majority of the meetings would then go to the questions and 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 I can say parents are a bit frustrated because there's no there isn't answers for these questions strictly because we haven't started the process officially so that that's my perception of the the two meetings that I went to and if um, Tiffany and Robert want to come back up I would like to echo what um, Sarah said that the parents did come into the meetings with the mindset that because again it was their idea that this was going to happen. I just checked in with my parent that I was sitting next to to ask her do you remember any negatives that were discussed and she said we did talk about the possible um, influence of the older kids with the younger kids and that just is encompassed in the safety bullet that we discussed earlier tonight. And to repeat what she said, that that was the biggest thing was the concern for 
having um, primary age kids on the same campus as middle school students. That, that was the big concern um, that was brought up during those meetings. Uh, but then it kind of went on to just, you know, questions about every, you know, bell schedule, dismissal times, cafeteria, things like that. So um, can I get a sense as to the level of parent participation from the Mark Hopkins parents? I mean, was it, I, I doubt if you ever get 100%, but did you have a substantial number of parents uh, who came up with this idea, or are we talking about oh. to? I had a number of parent meetings. I can tell you that when it was vocalized at the community, our community room was standing room only, um, and it was held in our cafeteria. I can share that at one of our parent meetings, what was documented was 126 parents in attendance um, as one of the nights, the February 26th night that we were discussing this. So those just give you some numbers of who was at Mark Hopkins. And then on March 20th, when we had the joint meeting at Rosa Parks um, at 8 in the morning, I know I had at least 25 parents in the, um, in the library that was full. All right, thank you. Member Hanson. Mm, I'd like to move uh, this item from conference to action. I have a motion by Member Hanson, a second by Vice President Wu. But before we get to the vote, we have a comment by Board Member Pritchard. I actually, uh, I am, uh, I'm in support if this works for us. But my really big concern is we don't have a plan. We don't even know how much money it's going to cost us. And we just closed seven schools and putting that price tag on the back of their, on, on their backpacks in the sense. So I, I'm just really concerned that we're going to pass something. We don't even know what it entails. We're just going to do it and then say, we'll just figure it out when it, when it arises. I don't, I'm not quite getting the whole concept of how we could support something without knowing ahead of time of how it's going to affect us. I think closing the elementary schools was kind of a different concept. We knew they were going to move from one elementary school to another. We were going to close the school. This entails us moving equipment, putting in bathrooms, move, you know, it, it entails so much more. So I'm just really concerned that we, we don't even know how much this is going to cost the district in a sense. So um, I know that there was an action. I, it, to, to move this, but I, I would really like to see this pulled and then at least have some ballpark numbers, something in a sense of just telling us this is what we think it's going to cost us. You know, that way we kind of know and we know that we're making a sound decision of, of being able to do this. Superintendent. Uh, thank you, President Cooney. I wanted to address one of the issues that, that gets talked about, which is this notion of middle schools, K-8. This isn't going to be a a K-8, it's going to be something different. Um, there are many um, advantages that I think you heard tonight ab ab about a K-8 school, and I think that our middle schools also offer um, many advantages. And, but one of the things that our, our K-8 struggle with, um, particularly as we get into the middle school grades, and, and, and I know because my children have attended two of them, is um, many students leave. Many students want to go to uh, the larger middle school um, for a variety of reasons. Um, they want to take and have opportunities to take more classes, to, to have opportunities to take more electives. Uh, they want to be able to participate in, in sports and other activities and clubs that middle schools, uh, because of their size, um, are able to offer. And a as a result, many of our K-8s, um, in fact, struggle at the grade 7 and 8 level. And, um, and I think that is one of the big drawbacks with our K-8s, that, um, that, that we simply can't offer enough opportunities for our, our young people as they get into these, um, to these older grades. So I, I think we have here a, a very unique situation. Um, in fact, Rosa Parks is growing. Um, there are outstanding things occurring at Rosa Parks. Um, the school is growing. Uh, more and more students that have in the past uh, avoided or opted out of Rosa Parks uh, are now coming to Rosa Parks. 
And uh, as a result, um, there are more opportunities that can be offered, um, more classes, more electives, more um, after school, more before school, um, clubs, uh, athletic sport teams. And so I, I, I think we have something here um, that will be very, very, very unique. And, you know, I, I wish I had thought of it myself. Um, you know, but I hadn't, and I and I didn't, and um, and I give the credit to the to the community and to the parents in that community for coming up with with an option um, that's not about walking a plank, you know, with or without a blind field. With all due respect, um, it's about doing something that I think is gonna um, is gonna take something to the next level, a much a much higher level. There will be costs. There will be one time costs. We've heard. Um, um, moving a, a portable will, will cost $75,000. There will be some costs um, to remodel. Um, there will be some costs to put in some, some different bathrooms and some, and, and some carpets. Those costs uh, can be determined. Um, we will provide you with those. But those are one-time costs, um, not ongoing costs. Um, ongoing costs and, and ongoing savings um, through, these, um, through these changes that have been already supported by the board. So... Um, uh, for that and for these reasons, uh, I, I think we're very excited about this possibility um, to grow something in this in this community um, that doesn't exist in other places. Board Member Rodriguez. Thank you for indulging me one more time. I am sorry. I just had to like comment on something here. Rosa Parks is growing and Mark Hopkins is growing. That's a fact. We I just confirmed that Mark Hopkins has increasing um, enrollment. And if all this holds true from what the superintendent said, Rosa Parks is growing, then we can expect for the school to grow um, in enrollment. And so putting these two schools together on the, on the one site, it worries me. Because are we going to outgrow them? And how many of the seventh grade students from Slow and Bidwell are not going to be able to get in there into Rosa Parks? Because now we've just messed with our capacity, a full load, full load of capacity at a junior high and middle school. I don't believe that the parents envisioned that their students were going to move from Mark Hopkins into Rosa Parks when they said, why don't we make it a K through eight? That wasn't their vision. They were thinking along the lines of John Steele. It's the same setup. You have a elementary school next to the bigger facility that fits bigger children. We have right now a school site that is perfectly built for K through six students with smaller bathrooms, with a playground facility, with all of these other things that children from K through six need. And now we're going and we're going to put an additional expense to modify to an extensive degree another school site just because we misunderstood parents and saying, why don't we make it a K through eight? That wasn't their vision. There's a fence that separates the two school sites. It shows in the map. <clears throat> Making it a K through eight would have removed the principal. And we would have got the cost savings realized by that. Maybe a few other staff. Facts. Let's look at facts. Let's look again at the cost of how much this is going to cost. And it is, yes, it is pretty innovative. But it hasn't been done. Yes, it has. We, it's been done at John Still. K through 8 is what it's called. We just went through a design team over there last year. But we didn't do the same thing here. And I had questioned that already. So no, I know don't, I don't buy that, that any of this stuff has is, is never been done. It's a one-time cost with interest. So it's the one-time cost that keeps giving and giving because we're going and we're taking bond money out, and on that bond money, we're, we're accumulating interest that the taxpayers have to pay. And that money could be used for other school sites that truly need those desperate impact, the, the desperate uh, improvements on those school sites. I don't know why we're doing this. 
It doesn't make sense. It needs further study, and I agree with Board Member Pritchett. Pull it. Do some more study. Do some more homework. Humble yourselves to, in order to do so. Don't just say it's because we have to. Say because we want to do the right thing for our families and our communities and those who contribute to our school district. I would just like to take a moment and thank everyone for being here tonight. Uh, respect that you are away from your families and uh, are taking your time out of your busy schedule to present this information to us. <clears throat> Vice President Kenny. Thank you. A um, couple of things is one is that will bond money be spent to do this? Yes. But if you look at the sustainability plan, if you'd kept both schools open, bond money would have been spent at both schools anyway. They're both part of the sustainability plan. And so bond money was always planned on being spent here. Um, but that being said, I'm going to, once again, most people who have followed me on this board for over four years know that I am a fan of the K-8 system, of the K-8 uh, model. Um, yeah, I, a lot's been spoken at different times tonight about the value of having kids in schools. And I may not be good at a lot of things, but it turned out I was pretty good at procreating. And, uh, you know, with four kids that have gone through these schools, um, you know, I've, I've, I saw 16 different schools and different models, and um, uh, I'm a big believer in the K-8 system. That may not be coming from, you know, definitive educational study, but it sure does come from the gut of a parent that saw it up close. Uh, I'm also, you know, it said, you know, it's been said that, you know, listen to the community, do this for the community. I am listening to the community. Um, I've talked to people in this community, and I've seen them here. Um, so I'm very supportive of this. I think it's good for the community. Um, we're all, people are going to disagree whether you like the K-8 or not. I happen to fall on the side of the fence that does. So that's why I will be supporting it, and I'm now calling the question of conference to action. It is called to question. We had the original motion by Member Hansen. We have the second by Vice President Wu to move the item from conference to action. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed, uh, Ms. Member Pritchett. Abstentions? We are now in action. I do have one question before we go. From the principal's perspective, what do you think needs to be done to make it K-8 viable? I mean, what kind of... Please. Just, I don't need a laundry list. I, I'm just trying to get it from your perspective. Like, just some of the... the are you the, talking... The, the, the works part, the capital... You talk facility-wise? Ex exactly. Okay, um... Obviously, kinder has to be the, the classrooms that we have That's an cool. idea about where it has to be bathroom-wise, all that kind of stuff has to be brought down. Um, a, kinder, a kindergarten playground uh, that should be fenced in. Um, uh, classrooms with some carpeting. Now, I don't know if I'm not a carpenter. I'm a son of a, son of a carpenter, but I'm not a carpenter. Uh, Son of a, I'm sorry, was that? I'm not. I'm the son of a carpenter. Yeah, <laughs> the carpeting um, is a concern for parents, and, and as a former elementary school teacher myself, you know, you like to have your class sit. So that's something that has to be looked at. Um, those are the big ones that I've noticed, and, and, and an elementary playground also. Okay, and then that you think would generally be get, get, get your school ready for a, a K program. Yeah, thinking directly right now, yeah. Yeah, no, I know it's hard. I'm yeah. Just you know your school better than, right. than I do. So. Okay, I appreciate yeah, that. Thank you. Um, I will um, move, move, uh, move to approve resolution number uh, 2740. Second. I have a second by Vice President Wu. All in favor? All right. right. Opposed? Uh, no. We have a no from uh, Member Pritchett and a no from uh, Member Rodriguez. Abstentions? Resolution 2740 has been approved. Item 10.3, school closure transition update. It is an information item, 15-minute presentation, 15-minute discussion. Superintendent Raymond. I'll ask Ed Manansella and Sue Halsey to come forward, please. Good evening, President Cunha, Superintendent Raymond, and members of the board. 
Uh, my name is Ed Manansella. I'm the interim chief of staff. Um, and along with Sue Hulsey, the transition team lead, administrator, and along with um, three distinguished principals, Corey Buckmaster, Celeste, Ellen Lee Carlson, and, and Richard Dixon, we're here to present our second school closer transition update. I, I want to begin with just um, a review of our commitment to the community uh, through this transition process. The, the district is committed to making sure students and families are taken care of during this transition. Again, the, the children and the families are going to be the center um, piece of all our decisions and actions. But the district will work with our partners to provide families all the support they require during this process. Uh, the district will address the individual needs of each student and family. And uh, most importantly, communication will be consistent and regular with families throughout this process. So as uh, Sue Holsey uh, begins to present on some of the specifics, again, just wanted to um, frame it around the commitment. Thank you. Good evening, uh, President Cuneo, board members, uh, Superintendent Raymond. Um, I'm here tonight to, again, give you an update on our transition process that we've been going through with the, with the uh, seven uh, close closing schools and the uh, receiving sites. Um, I wanted to um, make sure I can, there I go. I wanted to uh, review our transition structure with you. Um, this is a slide I showed last month when I came to present for the first time. And we have three key groups um, that we're working with. We have our community stakeholder transition team. We have a district level transition uh, support team. And then we have our school site transition teams. Um, the purpose of these groups, obviously, is to help in the transition process for our families, our, and I will go into more detail about the communication structure, the role and purpose, and um, just uh, for your purposes this evening, there's communication that goes on within each of these groups and communication that is radiated out and back in to help um, uh, discuss the transition process, uh, discuss issues, and um, center around resolution to any challenges that we might be facing. Um, I felt that you might want to know uh, the most current information on our enrollment de data. One of our primary concerns right now is student placement. So uh, I did want to reiterate that we've held um, transition clinics at each of the closing school sites where parents could come in and we had staff available to answer questions, to help them with the enrollment process, certainly to make sure they understood what school site their, their child had been um, assigned to and the options that they might have should they need or want to participate in the open enrollment process. Some of our dates that we um, have here for open enrollment on March 20th, open enrollment, the open enrollment window closed, and we extended uh, the window to 21 days this year. Uh, by April 30th, our families will be notified of the results of the lottery. Um, we're, we, I do believe that the results will uh, come sooner than that. However, I wanted to give a window of time necessary just in case there were extenuating circumstances, but we know that our families will be notified by the end of the month. Some data that we have, just current, uh, we know that 1,309 families, elementary families, access the open enrollment process this year. This is up about 500 families from last year. Um, we had 453 families from the closing school sites access the process, and just a matter of information, 180 families uh, applied for um, the open enrollment or put in an open enrollment application in the uh, extended three days that we offered them. Um, and um, we, we, district office staff is working uh, very closely 
uh, now uh, with, the, uh, with the enrollment office to make sure that we have um, enough spaces for families, if it's possible, and, what, and the outcomes of the, of the open enrollment lottery. Um, uh, they're working with the principals and determining classroom use, et cetera. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the support teams that we have in place. Um, I mentioned them the last time I was here. I meet uh, almost weekly, uh, sometimes it's every two weeks, um, with the district, district transition support team. And you can see the participants in that group. We have uh, members from just about every single department that might touch on the tra transition process. Their purpose is uh, designated there, and, uh, and it really does provide the a forum for all of the departments involved to surface issues, to, to present the timelines for the work that they will be responsible for. It helps us to, to uh, have a cross flow of in information so that all the parties are at the table, and if every, uh, any department needs some support from another, um, that is available right there. Um, we also, uh, our, dis our discussion uh, surrounds um, uh, anticipated needs from the site or things that might surface. And again, it allows us to be responsive to the site transition teams as their need arises. Part of the roles and responsibilities of each of the members on the district transition support team is to actually go out to the site transition meetings if there is a need and if there is a request. And they're all very willing to do that. So um, it's been a very valuable uh, group to have, uh, particularly in terms of having the information from every department in one place at one time, and it's very timely for us. We uh, met with a community partners group um, yesterday for the very first time. Um, these are key representatives from uh, some of the major uh, partners here in the district. Membership includes uh, participants from DAC, uh, the Black Parallel School Board, um, HIP, PTA, our uh, Parent Teacher Home Visit Program, City Year, uh, BHC, DLAC, CAC, Roberts Family Development, and the City of Sacramento. It also includes interested parents and community members, and um, Stacy Bell and I are the district representatives on that committee. Um, this, um, we had a very productive meeting, as I said yesterday, and it's clear that we've already established a common goal of working together uh, for the benefit of the students here in the district in terms of this transition process. Uh, it's a very lively group. They uh, have very strong opinions about uh, what we need to do and should do around the transition, but uh, definitely we're very welcoming of of any input and feedback that they can provide us, and we are really expecting them to be active members in this transition process. We talked about it yesterday, even though it was our introductory meeting, what role they might play in this process, and um, it, it really is up to the individual. It could be just attending the meetings on a regular basis and providing us with uh, information that they're receiving from the field, from their uh, representative groups, or it could be as involved as actually participating in the site transition team meetings, or um, we're thinking, we're hoping that we might be able to um, employ them in the home visit program this, this summer, uh, doing some mini, um, mini training and hopefully going even out to the homes and visiting the families uh, to help them through this transition process. But that's a wish and a hope, but um, at any rate, they're, uh, welcome to participate in any or all activities that they are interested in. And we, we welcome that, um, their level of support and their level of, uh, their perspective, actually. It's a, it's a different perspective than in the trenches. So I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, one thing I, I noticed and I thought was very important that some of the members have been through the closure process themselves, either as parents or as employees in the district. So their perspective on, on uh, their experiences, I believe, will be very, very helpful to uh, our process as we move forward. 
Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our site transition teams, just a little, because we have our principals here to share their experience with their, their first meeting. But again, um, they have a, probably the most critical role in uh, talking about programs, uh, the transition process itself, what they can do for the families, the specifics, every school site that's closing, and every receiving site has a unique culture, a unique person personality, and we want to do our best to blend those and create an, an exceptional experience for the students when they return to school after summer break. So I would now like to introduce you to the principals, uh, Ellen Lee from William Land, um, uh, Corey Buckmas Buckmaster from Theodore, Theodore Judah, and Richard Dixon from Washington. Come forward, please. Good evening, Superintendent Raymond and fellow board members. Um, prior to spring break, Ms. Celeste, uh, Mr. Dixon, and I, we held our first transition meeting. We felt it was important based on the decision of when the school closures were to be made that we had the meeting before spring break. We had our first meeting, and amongst the three schools, um, we had 34 individuals that were part of our transition teams. Between the three schools, we had 14 parents, nine teachers, two after-school program directors, six classified staff, and of course, um, the three of us as, as administrators. Um, amongst the parents, there were representatives from various cultures, backgrounds, um, in terms of um, ethnicity, language as well, and from various school-wide um, committees, such as School Site Council, PTA, and ELAC. And so we felt that the 34 members of our transition team was a, a good representation of um, the makeup of our community and its stakeholders. And prior to our first meeting, um, Ms. Celeste, Mr. Dixon, and I, we, we took part in several planning sessions to determine what were the goals and priorities um, for our families, our students, and our community. And with that in mind, um, we, of course, divided up responsibilities and um, felt that it was essential that we kept in mind we needed to be inclusive of all, be active listeners, have a collaborative approach, and shared leadership with all of the stakeholders. And with that being said, we had our first meeting, and in our opinion, it was very successful. And um, Ms. Celeste is going to be sharing more details about our first meeting here. Thank you. Mr. President, before we start so that we don't have to interrupt anybody, I think that we need a motion to extend the meeting. So I'd like to uh, move that we extend the meeting to 1115. Second. We have a motion to extend the meeting to 1115 by Vice President Kenny, second by Vice President Wu. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? We have extended the meeting. Good evening, board members. I'm Corey Celeste. The goal for meeting one, really, before we could get to working on the blending, was to get to know one another. So we provided space and opportunity for each of the schools to talk about themselves and share what was unique about each of them and the programs that they provide. Um, after we did that, we then started a brainstorming session about um, the types of topics that we'll need to consider. And that provided space for people to share the hot topics that are on their minds, such as transportation, safety, and after-school programs, and some of the common themes that you've heard from the community meetings already. After that, we led an activity around prioritizing the topics that they wanted to start with first. And so our next, and that allowed us to then start um, identifying those, those key pieces that will help people to start feeling better about the process and moving forward. That also gave us some pre-planning work to coordinate with the district transition team and any district staff that we need to, to get on board for our next meeting. I think the most important thing, too, that to note with regards to allowing space and time for the schools to talk about each other as individuals is that it allowed us to um, create space to note um, how we are unique, but also set the stage to look at how we are very similar. And so in our next meeting coming up, we'll be using that information for how schools um, talked about themselves to roll out an activity to start looking at Yes, we may have some differences, but look, folks, we're more alike than we are unalike. Thank you. 
Good evening, President Cuneo, uh, Superintendent Raymond, members of the board. It's good to be with you. My name is Richard Dixon, and I'm the principal at Washington Elementary. I hope tonight to uh, do to do justice to the Washington perspective uh, throughout this process. It's fair to say that it's been an emotional time for our community, uh, both during the process leading up to the decision and since the decision. Um, our teachers have been exemplary in leading our students to process this information in a healthy way, providing opportunities to engage socially and emotionally, write journal reflections, class meetings. I think in many, many respects, it's been more difficult for our adults. And I think for a time, certainly before the enrollment clinic and the first transition meeting, there was a feeling of uh, intense anxiety around the uncertainty in our future, and yet um, our inability to participate in the work around shaping uh, our future. Um, I've detected a subtle and nuanced change in the conversations on campus, uh, the dialogue on campus between myself and parents and between parents and each other. Uh, since the meeting, I think, as Mrs. Celeste said, the opportunity to see the commonalities between the schools, to have them speak with passion about their traits, their characteristics, their programs, their identity, helped us to see ourselves in the two schools and to know that caring and dedicated uh, adults are waiting for us in our transition. Uh, as we begin to plan the blending activities um, that will bring us further together, I wanted to share uh, my experience this evening, actually. Uh, I came uh, straight to the meeting from our second uh, mural day, and we have a project based on last year's Washington students who, through their work, earned a very substantial Project Green grant, some of which is being used uh, in our mural project, which we have just begun. A very skilled facilitator and nationally recognized artist called Milton Bowens is working with our community. Uh, today was day two, <coughs> excuse me, and he is... Um, <coughs> facilitating the students, the families, uh, to provide um, descriptions and uh, drawings of what they want the mural to look like. And then, rather as we did during our transition meeting, uh, Mr. Bowens is looking at commonalities and asking us to see what connects us. Um, this is going to produce uh, a mural which the children and the families are going to paint. And the mural is then going to be split into two, Half is going to go to William Land, half is going to go to Theodore Judah, and then Mr. Bones is committed to working with both those two new school communities to add a half to the mural. So in a figurative and literal sense, our students will be taking something with them from their school, but will be participating in something new that will be you know, symbolic of the coming together of communities in two new schools. Uh, so we're excited about that. Um, Obviously, challenges remain. Um, for example, many of our families have come to rely on the before-school daycare program and the after-school start program um, for their child supervision needs and have based their work schedules and their ability to work around that. Um, and there's a great deal of concern that in the future they'll be asked to choose between their child participating in an after-school program or taking the bus home, possibly to an empty home. Um, so um, concerns remain. But as we continue this work from a personal point of view, um, I just want to share that I've known uh, Mrs. Celeste for 10 years since we taught together at Cesar Chavez, and uh, after that as she was our principal there. Um, I've known um, Miss Lee since my wife and daughter, my wife as teacher, my daughter as student, um, began attending the school at the start of this year. I believe in both the schools, and they've demonstrated, the teams have demonstrated their readiness to stand shoulder to shoulder with us in this work. Uh, and I know we're going to do it right, and I know, I know our families are going to be treated with care and respect, and we appreciate the support of the district and, and your support as we advance our work. Thank you. Thank you. That's a hard act to follow, actually. Um, Mr. Dixon did speak about challenges, and I, I know that um, uh, Member Arroyo had mentioned when I was last here that he, you know, he, want, he didn't just want to hear about all the progress we were making, but he did want to hear about the challenges that we might be facing also. And I would have to um, 
say that uh, the emotional environment um, is, is, is a challenge. It really is. It's a challenge for the principals. It's a challenge for those of us who are supporting the principals and the families. Um, the student placements, principals uh, are awaiting their placements for next year. Teachers and our classified staff are awaiting their placements also. So when, when they, there's the unknown, there's always that fear of the unknown. So um, as soon as we can go through our processes, uh, that will help with that situation. I think um, that will help us move forward more quickly. Um, it's, it's not an issue of someone's fault. It's an issue of, you know, using the district processes that we have in place and ed code and um, contractual agreements to, to help us move this, al this along. Um, the second challenge that I would mention is um, transportation. That, that's come up at all of the site transition team meetings that I've attended. Uh, we've tried to mitigate that uh, before spring break. We uh, distributed the bus routes to the tentative bus routes and walking routes to the, the, uh, all of the affected principals so they could communicate that information to their families knowing that um, there may be some uh, shifts, minor shifts based upon open enrollment numbers and um, more information that might come forward as we proceed through this, uh, through the transition process. Uh, but we do plan to have those solidified uh, as soon as possible. Um, I would also say that um, safe schools and transportation are working very closely together. They're also working with the city of Sac or city police and walk Sacramento to make sure that we have safe routes for, for the kids to walk um, to school, to their new school, if they, if they choose uh, to do that. And um, we're also trying to bring solutions, help the school sites with solutions regarding transportation. Um, it is an issue at, at most school sites, not all, but most. And where it is an issue, there are different solutions that might apply to each neighborhood. So we're trying to look at those individually and really help them with those, uh, those challenges that they might be facing. Um, child development programs, again, uh, we're looking for placements right now. We're looking for space in uh, the receiving sites and making sure that the space complies with the regulations and requirements of those programs. We have so many programs um, throughout the district that it really is um, that it's hard to give you a blanket answer as to whether a program will fit at a particular school or not. So, but those, uh, those uh, issues are being worked out as we speak. Uh, the rooms are being identified. Uh, also, the, there will be a mass mailing to the families uh, about the child development programs in the district uh, coming up within the next week or so. And so parents will get that information uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, we also are looking at our before and after school programs. We know that we will have uh, after school programs in every receiving site. They have them now, they will continue to have them. We're looking at the expansion of those if possible. Um, there are, again are regulations that are uh, uh, part of the grants that uh, the school district receives for those programs. And we are also looking at an equitable process for families can, uh, to access uh, the after school programs uh, that will be available. So those are some of the challenges. Um, there are quite a few others that crop up on a daily basis that we try and be timely uh, and responsive to, uh, but these are the major ones that, are, that continue for us until we can move through uh, the transition process and understand the more solid numbers that we might have, knowing where students will be attending and what the particular needs are for each uh, receiving site based upon the information that flows up bubbles up from the site transition team. So they are very, very important to us. Um, I know it's also asked to provide some, some goals. What are the goals of the transition? And uh, in the short term, certainly uh, having parents know where their children are attending. All the students have been actually assigned a, a new site. Um, but again, open the open enrollment process was an option, and it, 
a significant number of families uh, exercise that option. So we want to finalize those student placements as quickly as possible, uh, engage our, uh, our stakeholder groups as partners in this process, and we have begun to do that. Uh, actually, we're well on our way to doing that as, as we speak. Um, we are, uh, I'm asking for timelines for the work that's uh, being done in the district so that we all know uh, that it's going to be done in a timely fashion so that we can ready the rooms and make sure that the uh, schools are uh, ready and uh, available for the students uh, when they return to school in September. And then, of course, uh, we're looking at the redistribution of the materials and equipment and co uh, constant and consistent communication. Um, as much as we, we like to say we're communicating well, we can always do a better job at that. And we are looking at every means possible to uh, communicate effectively and well and in a timely fashion as we get the information. Sometimes we don't have it, but we, we're trying to get the answers as quickly as possible. Um, our midterm goals, again, continued stakeholder participation in the transition process. And as I mentioned, I want to make sure that uh, our community partners, our district office, uh, central office folks who are in the, on the transition team and, and the site transition teams are working effectively and we are being responsive to, to them. Um, we want to make sure that everyone is very clear on what their ro roles are and their responsibilities through this process. I'm relying heavily on um, departments meeting their timelines and uh, working uh, to their maximum capabilities to make sure that the, that the uh, uh, transition goes very smoothly. And then also, again, I, I uh, added constant and consistent communication because, again, that's the key uh, for us. And finally, the long-term goals are to make sure that this transfer is done in, for our students and families in a very respectful and sensitive manner. Um, we want to make sure that all of the facilities, the receiving sites, are equipped to handle the population, so there's some work to be done and that our stakeholders do have an active and meaningful role in this transition process, and again, that we are uh, communicating very clearly and consistently with um, all of the stakeholders, all of the parents, everyone uh, that is involved in this process. This is our timeline. It's a tentative timeline in that some of these dates um, may change, uh, Again, like I mentioned earlier, the uh, open enrollment notification may be earlier than April 30th, which would, which would uh, be a good thing. But um, at any rate, these are some of the, the dates uh, of significant events that will be occurring and events that are important to our parent population as well. And then um, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Mensal. So um, as, as we bring this to a close, prior to questions, I'm going to touch on the budget, and I'd just like to share a few closing thoughts. So um, the cabinet's in the process of identifying an appropriate transition budget based on the needs and available resources. So as you can see in the three bullet points, uh, the potential expenses include the lead administrator, the moving expenses, and the full inventory of closing school equipment and materials. And as you're aware, there's been a one-time transition cost that was built into the net right-sizing savings estimates, which was um, $158,000. But I, and again, we'll, we'll come back to you with more concrete figures in, our, in, in a future update. So the last time when we made our, uh, or provided a transition update, we obviously received um, critical feedback from the board, and we wanted to be able to present uh, to you a, a presentation that r responded to some of those concerns. But I think as adults in the room here, and of course um, as the board and the community, there's a lot of moving parts around this. But if you're going to, in, in my opinion, if you're going to really get to the heart and pulse of how things are going, you go right to the principal of the school. Um, principal Dixon stood up here as a principal who's going through probably one of the, the toughest roles, uh, who 
as a principal, I know you're the instructional leader. You're looking at the culture. You're looking at the operations of the school. You need to instructionally lead. You engage the parents, the kids. You're walking up and down the halls. And when he was speaking, he shared it was challenging, but I also heard um, the resilience of the children in his report. He spoke to the trust that's occurring with his colleagues. He spoke to the planning. All, all of these three spin principles spoke to the planning that was occurring in this transition um, that's taking place. And then even the beauty of uh, how they're integrating a transition even through an art project. These principles are leading effectively through a very difficult time and they are presenting at the very pulse of this transition. So I just want to be able to highlight that and I want to um, just acknowledge the, the leadership of the three individuals behind me and as they lead uh, these communities through a challenging time. So we're going to go ahead and open it up for a time of um, questions or comments from the board. Thank you for the presentation. We have public comment. We have four comments on 10.3 from Jessica Arriaga, Leo Bennett Cachon, Maria Rodriguez, and Grace Trujillo. Good evening, board members. Um, I come to you with a very heavy heart, um, and I really hope that you listen and you hear me because I'm worried. And the children may not be worried because they're little kids. They have no idea what they're about to enter into. So hear the voice of the parent. I plead with you. You've committed to, to safety and communication. And Superintendent Raymond, you said you would knock down on every door of every home to make sure every parent knew what was happening. That is not happening. You, I... We had the pleasure of having Sue at our transition meeting, and I had asked her, survey the community, find out how many parents don't know what schools that their children are going to. Please do that. How many students do you not know? How do you know how many children are going to be displaced if you don't know what their needs are? Do you know if they need before school programs? Do you know if they need after school programs? How do you know who's gonna be displaced if you don't know the needs? And you're not gonna know the needs unless you knock on every door, please. The other thing you mentioned, Cuno, is safety. It is a huge concern. So she, Sue said that there may be minor changes to transportation. I asked her on Wednesday to scrap your original plan because it is not safe. You intend, as a district, to take 300 students and have them meet at an abandoned school site for the buses to pick them up, to take them to Peter Burnett. Fruit Ridge, they're going to meet at Lawrence Park. I grew up in that neighborhood as a child, and even then, my parents didn't let me play at that park. So you're going to send 300 kids to wait for a bus in a neighborhood, their lives are challenging enough. Please do not. We live in a world where bad things happen to children every day, whether it's child abductions and to the more severe cases of shootings and just violence, a child will be playing, waiting for the bus and jumps out in front of the street while another parent is dropping their child off. These are all legitimate concerns. And for you to put that many children together, ranging 5 to 11, you're talking about bullying and everything else. So I'm asking you, strike that, I'm pleading and I'm begging you to really understand what you're doing as a district because I'm having sleepless nights. And I hope and I pray that you think about the words that I've uttered today and maybe you lose a couple of blinks of sleep because I'm losing hours. Thank you. My name is Leo Bennett Koshan. As been said over and over again, it certainly appears there is no plan. The PTA stated that there is no plan beyond just closing schools. You've heard tonight that you need to need portables, move portables. 
The original plan included moving three portables for Washington and one portable for CP Huntington, and now we're hearing two more for Mark Hopkins. At about $60,000 to $70,000 a portable move, you have just run through your entire transition budget, and you still have to pay your administration positions, moving costs. Where's the fiscal plan? You voted to do what you did to Mark Hopkins. $41,000 was their deficit by your calculations. And now you're going to blow through that money to move portables. And why is Mark Hopkins under capacity? Because it has 17 portables. It's a flawed process. You should be looking at your permanent counts, not buildings that are beyond expected life and all the other parts of a portable. You don't have a capacity issue in this district. You have a portable issue. They got put in place as you grew, and that's what you need to look at with the plan moving forward. Again, Mark Hopkins, you're going to combine it. You're going to show in your paperwork you have six extra classrooms. When you go into class size reduction, that's going to drop to three, and both sites are growing. You have no plan. You're going to run into a fence that you have to take down again between those sites. I had the privilege to attend the meeting at Washington. It was an excellent meeting. I've attended similar meetings in San Diego. High-income communities, they don't close their schools in that situation. They cluster them. They figure out efficiencies in administration, and they keep their sites open. That was one of the concerns. How are the receiving sites going to have enough room? Your process is closing Washington which has 60 more spaces if you than finish up, the other school. Your process is getting rid of Washington's Park and sending all those students to the play area If you could finish Woodland. up, please. Each board has its legacy. We've had a CERNA board that did some closing of schools, had CASA. It has its legacy. I like Gustavos. I wish he was here again. I'm telling you, your legacy is going to be the neutron board. You figured out how to empty schools, if you could create educational up, deserts. You need to step backwards. With all due respect, I did go really fast at other times. Thank you. Good evening, board. My name is Maria Rodriguez, and I'm thankful to live in a country where I can come here and speak before you, and I won't let that opportunity be wasted. A tale of two city schools, book two. So yes, I told my son this morning about why I was coming to this meeting, about my concern specifically for Washington, and I'm really glad that the Washington team is here. I had a handout that I hope will get passed around that shows that Washington is by far the farthest distance that children have to transition to. Um, besides that, not only is it the longest distance from their closing school to their new school, according to the SAC B, it's through some of the most dangerous city streets, the most violent city streets that we have. So I thought about last year, and there was AM Win, I think it was, that was supposed to be closed, and Superintendent Raymond, you, you, you reconsidered that one because of safety concerns. The cynical part of me thinks that the reason it was reconsidered is because A.M. Wynn had men in suits from their city council of Rancho Cordova come here and speak before the board. That's the cynical part of me. The trusting part of me is, is that you actually did go out to those streets and look at those streets and realize the danger that was there. So this morning, in the rain, in the drizzle, and in the sun, I walked the distance from Washington to William Land. And frankly, it was a beautiful walk. The only thing that threatened me was all the wonderful eateries that I needed to, that I wanted to stop in at. But I didn't do that. I kept walking. It didn't bother me, but I forgot. OK, so my son Cole, so I told him about why I was coming. And you know what his answer was? Those children will just have to adapt. And he's absolutely right. And Mr. Dixon is right. The children will adapt. But us adults see the injustice, that there's one school that has to adapt, 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 and other kids at my school, frankly, my peers do everything in their power to keep kids from having to adapt. They accommodate their every single whim. I want this teacher, I want this time, I want this, this. and their kids get it. There's two different schools in our school district. So Cole was right. 
that child who sees things clearly. The kids will adapt. The parents see the injustice, they will be mad. I walk that walk. I wasn't threatened, but if I imagine my 11-year-old son, Cole, walking from Washington to William Land, I ask that the transition team consider that there will be some kids who will have to walk because they will miss their bus. J Street is impossible to cross. Please ensure that there's a crossing guard at J Street at all times. Light rail passes through there. I myself didn't understand the rules of light rail. That thing comes down, it tells the cars to stop. But as a pedestrian, I'm like, I can go across there. I don't see a train coming. Teach kids what it means to how to cross trains the right way. There are a lot of dangers. There's a lot of other vivid things I saw along the way. People smoking. I mean, in my neighborhood, if you're smoking within any kid's range, you will be kicked out of a park. But people are smoking cigars and cigarettes all over the street. So again, there's different standards for different kids. And I'm not asking all this whole decision to be reversed, but you could reconsider some. And yes, I do want to focus on the positive things, but not to have it overshadow the really bad things. Thank you. Hello. I'm Grace Trujillo, and good evening, Jonathan Raymond and the board. I totally agree with Maria. I think that's one of the things that we're here. We had lunch together, uh, and actually, I should say din dinner, and we were talk talking about the differences in the different schools and why we're speaking. I say, I speak because my son has no voice. I'm his advocate. But there's, I'm also speak for the other kids that their parents either have low income, can't communicate, can't have the language or the ability to come. Right now is thinking, you know what? Everybody's coming here saying there's no policy committee, there's no budget committee. There's, the PTA doesn't want to come, doesn't feel like they have a voice. Parents probably in the same boat. You know, I'm getting to the point where I talk because I, people die for the fact for me to have the freedom of speech. I'm going to utilize it to the best. And to speak, I know there's people listening because I know they come up to me and say, Grace, you know what? Keep it up. Because there's a lot of injustice. And one of the key things, I agree with all the four people that just spoke right now. My key things, can you please put it up about the bond? One of the key things that I see I know they, they talk about savings, and, and Maria did a really good job saying that it's $166,000 savings. Portables are um, $775,000, um, um, but this doesn't include the interest that's going to be occurring. To give you an example, I got this from the uh, audit. If you go back, in six years from now, we're going to be paying $10 million in principle. Where is that money coming from? I know you guys say it's a one-time deal, but guess what? Interest is going to be incurring on that whatever amount it is. If it ends up being 180 the, the savings, that's going to be interest. So the reality, we're displacing all these children, causing all this frustration. And then another thing, there, you guys, um, Jeff, I really agree on accountability and standards. But guess what? This past five years, we've been putting these kids through cuts and cuts and cuts every single year. And like Maria said, it's only certain kids that get the disadvantage. And these particular kids, you're passing the cuts every single year, and now they're going to be displaced in a different situation. So with that, I myself cannot sleep thinking there's so much injustice. And I only thought this was happening in other countries. But it's happening here in my backyard. Board member, uh, board member Pritchard. Thank you, President Cunio. Um, I just have a few questions. Um, in regards to the lottery on slide four that you spoke about, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Was families notified of lottery outcome? Oh, um, that's the open enrollment lottery, um, and actually, if if there are fewer spaces uh, than requests for space, then um, um, those that that actually get into the school are are notified that they do have a place in school of choice, and those that if the the spaces um, 
fill up. And again, it's a lottery. It's not first come, first serve. It is a lottery uh, system. And so uh, those families who, uh, who were not able to get in because of the lack of space, then they go on a waiting list to get into their school. The kids that are being displaced, though, they have... They have first priority. They have first priority. Yes, they do. So the lottery is if they don't want to go to their... their the designated... The designated school. Correct. Okay. Um, if we can, if you can also send the board the, any of the literature that goes out, I know you had talked okay. about literature that will sure. be sent out to the parents. I'd Absolutely. like to see that just to kind of keep a, an, uh, not an eye, but like a heads up in a right. sense of like what's going out to right. the parents. We, we, that way if we're asked right. questions, then we know how to answer. Absolutely. Um, I know that, uh, one of the parents are talking about like a, a survey. Survey Monkey is a fairly, it's easy, it's free. Um, I don't know if it's possible that we can maybe do a Survey Monkey out to the parents just to see if we get a response back to find out some of those questions of do they know what school their kid's going to go to. Um, I, I'm assuming that the school sites have email addresses for parents, correct? Correct. Okay. Actually, we are responding to after uh, meeting with that, with uh, Bonheim uh uh, parents on Tuesday night. Uh, we are being responsive to that request from Ms. Ari Ariaga, and we're working with the principal on that particular issue. Great. Make sure that our outreach efforts are uh, comprehensive enough. Good. Thank you. Uh, board Member Rodriguez. Nobody else wants to speak on this, huh? <clears throat> Um, first of all, I want to send my um, um, my most heartfelt, sincere um, thanks and kudos to uh, Mr. Dixon. Um, fantastic job. Thank you for coming forward today and, and being honest and, and being genuine with your words. So I thank, I thank you very much. Um, you know, it concerns me that, um, you know, that... that Again, we just had a presentation earlier about chronic absenteeism, and um, I just, um, you know, lended my positive comments over to another staff member here who was taking a positive step in the right direction by um, getting information at least about the population of um, where it's occurring. Um, I'm going to extend that um, those words of advice that I just gave to them, though, um, you know, perhaps you could look at this report and understand where, what kind of population you're dealing with. Um, simply having meetings at the school site, um, having translators there so that people can understand, um, doing a survey monkey via email um, may not be enough. And we had a parent come forward and say, um, to our superintendent that he committed. And, and, you know, something that I didn't remember, but the parents are listening. He committed to go door to door to find out um, what needs our families had. And I see that not as an unrealistic goal for to ask my superintendent to go out to every single house of all seven schools that have been affected by this, but staff can. Um, Ms. Sue Holsley, you have the responsibility here. This is on your shoulders. You need to ensure that every single parent is being thoroughly and genuinely communicated with. So I, I hope to hear some of those results. We contacted... Of the 500 students at this school, we were successfully contacted 450, and we're working on the next 50. And each parent thoroughly understood what this meant. They signed this paper. They know the school that they're going to. They know about a lottery process, or they didn't, and they were informed. Get the details for us, because I'm hearing it out in the community. I'm hearing that people who understand our process, they're having difficulties of getting their children into a school. And these are people who understand our process. They're having frustrations 
about this process. So that, that's telling me that parents are not being communicated with. It concerns me that kids are going to an abandoned school site to take the bus to the next school that they've been assigned to. I mean, come on, really? This Probably the school that just closed on them, their former school, I'm, I'm just imagining that that's, I'm assuming it, let's just say, that that's the case. What a slap in their face. And the light rail dangers, I, I know what uh, Ms. Rodriguez was talking about. I have been crossing those streets down that, that pathway myself, and I just walked right across without even knowing that my life was in danger. In the city of Sacramento prides themselves in that they don't have as many accidents and when they do, it's because usually it's a pedestrian that wasn't being mindful. But we're talking about children. And should one child, should one child be harmed, that's too much for me. So, um, you know, I, 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 different standards for different kids. That's just what's ringing in my head right now. And, I, and I, I hope that you can find the needs of these communities and not continue that ugly cycle of having different standards for different kids. Thank you. Superintendent Raymond. Thank you, President Cunha. Um, Member Rodriguez, I just want to respond, respond to a, a, a couple things. When, um, you know, our, our commitment around communication is is true. Um, you know, you know, we're going to do everything possible to communicate with with every family, um, just like we did. I think we, we had good experience with it at at um, at Freeport, um, and um, so we're going to continue those e efforts. And you know, we're learning from our our input and feedback from the community. I would say on the transportation, look, there there haven't been any transportation routes finalized, and and I would agree. I'm I'm not going to support plans that have People act, you know, congregating in parks or congregating at at um, closed school sites. Um, you know, we're not there with the transportation yet. Um, we we, we um, will not be until we uh, until we know where students are going to be going. Once the open enrollment process has been finalized, and we know um, we know which students will be going to um, their open enrollment schools and which students will be going to their new home schools. Will we then be setting transportation routes? Um, you know, but we're not going to be congregating and aggregating. So I don't know where that information is being 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 um, disseminated. But it's not true, and and we're not at that place yet. So I just wanted to assure you, and I wanted to assure the other members of the of the public. I, I just board member Hanson. You can wait your time. Thank you. Just a couple quick questions. Um, and we know how many students are being transitioned, and it's approximately how many? About 20, around 2,200, I believe. And we know more or less. Who, and we know who they are. Can yes, you we tell do. me how many of them have selected another school or you know, filed, you know, their parents have filed to take we, them to another school? 435. So are you saying then that there's almost 1,800 that haven't selected another school? Correct. That are they have already been designated to go to a, a receiving site, a designated receiving site. For example, the students from Washington have uh, the boundaries have been changed, and those students have been redesignated at either Theodore, Theodore Judah or William Land based upon their residence. So those placements have already been made. It's those students whose parents do not wish them to attend their designated uh, resident school, new resident school. Mm -hmm. So we just assume then that the 1,800 are going to go to one of their designated schools. Is there, is there any direct communication where we know that, yes, I'm going to go to, you know, if a student at Washington has a choice to go to one of the two schools, do we know which school they've chosen to send their child to yet? Well, they didn't have the choice. It was based on their residence. So, so they were designated. All of the students 
I have from a closed school site have been designated, have been assigned to a designated receiving site based upon their address. Mm -hmm. So we assume that they're going to go to the that particular school that they're assigned. Well, to I I wouldn't want to assume anything actually, but. Um, the expectation is that they uh, they have accepted their uh, um, assigned school uh, mm -hmm. because it's close closer to their home, and in some cases probably closer may may be closer there than to their home than the actual school they were attending. So uh, you know it just depends upon where they lived. Mm -hmm. I guess you know or what, live. I'm, what I'm trying to get to is you know are there hundreds of students that are out there that are just lost in the process that don't know where they're going. It's my assumption and you know, the, my belief and the folks that I've talked to that know that's not the case, that actually children know where they're going yes. to, the parents know where they're sending their children. Those who don't want to send their children to that particular school have gone through the open enrollment process right. to try to choose another site. And that actually of the 2,200 students, all 2,200 are going to a school next year and their parents know where that is well that that's our our hope and I maybe um, I don't mean to put you on the spot mr. Dixon but you might want to talk about um, the process you use to notify your parents and what your belief on this is. certainly um, bilingual communication per letter from the district per letter from myself um, several connected messages we use some of the materials from the open enrollment clinic that you attended, board member Hanson. Uh, the large maps we put in the window of the office, um, it was typical to see in those early days, students, families gathered around those maps. Um, myself in conversation with parents and uh, children, bringing them into the office, looking up their information to tell them. Not... Um, solid data by any means, but the uh, day two of the uh, mural project that I, I came to the board meeting from, um, Milton Bowens asked um, for the very crowded classroom to split into two, working around the two halves of the mural, and he asked the students where they were uh, going and, and based the division on that, and only one student didn't know uh, the school uh, she was going to uh, a third grade student didn't know the rest of the students did know mm -hmm. okay well i think if it's possible and I, I would be under the assumption that a child you know that a parent has to fill out some sort of form to enroll their child at a school that they're not in now it would be comforting to us to know you know how many of those 2200 are actually know where they're going to they've filed some sort of paperwork so so we don't have to talk about anecdotes that we actually right, have right. something. I think that'd be, because I assume that the vast majority, I know that it probably is similar to the numbers that the principal stated. Uh, I think that'd be valuable for us. So okay. we don't have misinformation Correct. You know, masquerading as fact. Uh, I went to the Washington transition meeting. I was very impressed. I uh, was glad to see the principals there from the receiving schools. Uh, I talked to parents there. I get a lot of emails. Uh, I know that are, there are folks that are here that are speaking on behalf of folks. I want to assure them that just because other parents aren't here in the room that their voices aren't being heard. They talk to me and the other school board members, I'm sure, every single day, and I get many, many uh, emails and calls and discussions every single day. Um, and I was going to talk about the dangerous streets around Washington, but I don't know, that's been my neighborhood for 12 years and I've lived all over downtown and I didn't really see that. So I, I was a bit mystified by that comment, but I don't really need to go into that, I suppose. But uh, uh, I've been, was very satisfied with what I saw happening there. I know this is going to be extraordinarily challenging for a lot of people still, and we're going to be obviously fully dedicated to it. So uh, I'd like to see some more of that information if we can find out about, you know, students knowing where they're going to be uh, it seems that that should be available. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Barbara Hamilton. I would just like to piggyback on a couple of things that have been said. I, I see after, I'm assuming that after the open enrollment notification goes out, there will be some solidification of, we, we'll know where the disbursement of kids are, right? Absolutely. Can we yes. get those numbers? Can yes. we get them per, per closed school and where they're going? Yes. And secondly, I see, I, since we're going to be coming back the second meeting, to discuss again the, the transition process. I see that the 
transportation and walking routes will be solidified by that point in time? Well, well, we're waiting for open enrollment for that to happen, and we're still in discussion. At, like I mentioned, they're very tentative, but we wanted to get the information out so we could get some feedback and response to what was I, out. So. I, I respect all that. What I'm just saying is that it, it, I'd like the rest. I, if we're going to talk about it at that time, right. I'd like that to be a major okay. discussion point. I'd like to have some sense of what Member Hansen, if that is in fact measurable, the, the um, percentage of, of, of kids and families who know where they're going, if that can be measured, where they're going, and, and transportation routes, I think would be two very good things to concentrate on for that meeting. Okay. Uh, Board Member Rodriguez. Thank you. And, and this was to be a response to the superintendent about um, his comments that he made. Um, so, Mr. Superintendent, um, you know, what you said, um, you know, I actually, I agree with, um, you know, that, and I believe your comments about, um, your, about the transportation and, um, and so what I would ask you to do is be mindful of your contractor because your contractor seems to be misrepresenting your values your um, your ethics out there in the community. Um, this is not the first time that I've had to say something um, on the bi board dais. So um, perhaps having pre-meetings before she goes out to the community um, and getting a, a, a good sense because we had a parent. And, I'm, and the only reason why I'm bringing this up is because we have a parent that's here. It's not, it's not hearsay. The parent came forward and said she heard this from your consultant contractor. Um, so, um, and then you sound like you're, when you presented yourself, it sounded conflicting information. I don't want that to be the case. Um, so let's, let's make sure we all are working as part of the same team. We all are working as, you know, with the information that's accurate. Um, and so that we don't have to defend ourselves any further against one position or another. Um, so I, I, I trust, um, Superintendent, that you will do this and be mindful of what we're saying to a very uh, grief-stricken community at this point um, because they're very fragile. Thank you. I appreciate all the hard work that you do on behalf of the district and for the kids in our communities. And I know it's a difficult issue, and I, I really do appreciate it. And I say that on behalf of the board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's uh, 10 12. We have, or 11 12, sorry. Um, wish it was 10 12. <laughs> 11 15 is uh, the cutoff. Do we want to make a motion to continue the meeting? And the rules. Motion, motion to suspend the rules by Vice President Kenny. Second by Vice President Wu. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? We have suspended the rules. How late do we want to go? I don't want to go past 11. All right. We have a, do we have a motion. Move to 11:30. Move second. move uh, to extend to 11:30. Uh, Member Kennedy, uh, Vice President Wu. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? We're to 11.30. Abstention by uh, Member Rodriguez. So we have 15 minutes, so if we could be mindful. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. 10.4. Review and increase of school lunch prices. It's a conference first reading. It's a 10-minute presentation, 10-minute discussion. Um, you're not Richard Odegaard. <laughs> He's the new and improved version. <laughs> There is no substitute, but this is uh, our, our new chief Forrest. business officer, uh, Mr. Ken Forrest. President Cuneo, members of the board, and Superintendent Raymond, uh, we have a very brief presentation for you tonight uh, with a recommendation. So <clears throat> as we go through this, we also have uh, food service manager, uh, Brenda Padilla, here with us tonight if you have questions. So first, just an overview, uh, we have 62% of our Enrolled students are eligible for uh, free lunch, 8% for reduced lunch, and 30% are paid. Um, under the uh, Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act, uh, we are required to begin to bring our paid lunch price 
up closer to the actual reimbursement we received from the federal government. I won't bore you with the facts uh, that are on this slide, but our proposal tonight will bring the district closer to meeting that federal requirement. As you can see, uh, currently compared to surrounding districts, uh, Sacramento City Unified has the lowest meal prices. To comply with this uh, uh, Healthy uh, Hunger Free Kids Act, um, we are recommending an increase again of 25 cents to the paid lunch price. No increase in the breakfast price is recommended at this time. So here is a history of your lunch prices, uh, where they started out and what the rec recommendation is. This does brings you closer, but does not meet the federal requirement. So at some point, uh, we will have to return to the board uh, with another recommendation for an increase. Um, in addition to the recommendation to increase the lunch price by 25 cents per meal, we're also recommending that the board suspend charging uh, the fee for the reduced meals. By doing this, we anticipate that it will be a break-even proposition because we anticipate the participation to go up. So in effect, you suspend the fee from those parents who are, have the reduced price. You eliminate the responsibility of the district to go after the negative balances, which are approximately $156,000. And you receive federal reimbursement to offset the revenue loss by not collecting the fee. So this is an example of what is anticipated. By not collecting the fee, we anticipate a revenue reduction of $213,300, but uh, we anticipate a minimum increase of 390 uh, meals for lunches and 137 for breakfast. Using the federal reimbursement rate, you can see that is a direct offset to the non-collection of that revenue. Therefore, this would be a zero subsidy um, proposition for the board. In addition, I would like to remind the board that this is your food service fund and in no way will this impact the general fund. That for some reason the slide is hung up. Uh, there we there go. go. So we recommend approval of both uh, recommendations, an increase of 25 cents on the meal price and uh, their elimination of the reduced collection fee for lunch. Thank you, uh, Vice President Kenny. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, Ms. Padilla, um, you know, it would be highly inappropriate, but I could kiss you. Um, I think that this, this is really, you know, heading... We've been talking about this since you've been here, and this is heading in the right direction. I think we're going to increase participation for the kids who need it the most. We're, it's always driven me nuts that we're subsidizing the um, paid-for lunch with the free and reduced. I think this is just a, a great proposal, so thank you very much. Vice President Wu. Thank you, President Cuneo. Mr. Forrest. Could you run this by me just slower this time because it's kind of late and I'm kind of tired. Slow, and <laughs> you got 10 minutes. We are raising the fee because we must bring the charge that we uh, um, charge for the, for the meal closer to the federal um, uh, cost. The federal reimbursement, which we receive on a per meal basis. And so, then we're suspending the the same fee. Who are we suspending it for? We're, we're only we are the recommendation is to suspend the fee for the reduced lunch participants. So currently, you have three categories of students uh, participating in the school lunch program. You have those who are eligible to receive a free lunch those whose income level only qualifies them to receive a reduced price lunch. And for that lunch, they're paying 40 cents. And then those who um, pay the full price for lunch. And what the federal government has said 
is that over a series of years, school districts are required to raise their paid price, the price that the 30% uh, of our students pay, to come closer to the federal reimbursement. <laughs> Sorry, sir. <laughs> Is that it? Okay. Yeah. Um, seeing no other questions, we appreciate the presentation. Item uh, 10.5, Coherent Governance Operational Expectations 12, Learning Environment Monitoring Report. It's a conference and action item. Uh, Superintendent Raymond. This came before the board uh, at our last board meeting, and so I'll entertain if there's any questions. Okay. Do we have any public comment, Mr. Ross? Public comment on 10.5? We have one comment on 10.5 from Leo Bennett Cochon. If I kiss you, Patrick, can I have a ticket? Mm. <laughs> oh, darn. Oh, yeah. Worth a try. Um, on page one, it says the board will be fully and adequately informed. I'm asking you to take a look at that because from my perspective, the school closures was a great surprise. The community voted for the bond issue. The week before, January 10th, you approved the school development and improvement plans, all of which would lend people to believe that all our schools were safe. And then we read in the environmental report that a task force of personnel met and reviewed the usage of school sites. I would assume that happened, hopefully in a somewhat timely manner, long before the board or the public became aware. So from my perspective, you were not fully and adequately informed in a timely manner. On the next page, it talks about a learning environment that is safe, respectful, and conducive. And I'm hearing from parents that they're not always feeling about the respect that, in fact, they've had transition meetings where district personnel have failed to show up because it had been double booked. Um, on the next operational expectancy, which is 12.1, high student achievement, there is a variety of attachments. And I think it's important to point out that C.P. Huntington, Fruit Ridge, Maple, and Mark Hopkins are all noted for their parent resource centers. And for academic achievement, that C.B. Wire had school-wide progress on its API. Joseph Bonheim had school-wide and every subgroup progress. And Maple Elementary had school-wide and every subgroup process. You would think that if small schools are able to demonstrate that level of performance, they would not be subjected to closure. This board had approved a multivariable approach in the past, and somehow it got changed to a single variable of capacity. I don't consider that the superintendent meeting your expectations, because that should have been a board policy decision. Thank you. Thank you. Any board member wish to comment? Okay, I'll move it from conference to action. Second one from the member Pritchett. Um, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? We are in action. I'll move the item to approve. Let me get to the right language. Um, uh, the Board of Education finds this OE policy to be in compliance. I'll move that. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Vice President Kenny. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? It passes uh, four to zero. 11.1 business and financial report we will receive the information and we have public comment two comments 11.1 from leo bennett cachon and maria rodriguez i would like to address your attention to page four where you see your out of district charter and you see that there are many, many students coming in here from out of district, which is commendable, but one has to wonder, we don't have room for some of our in-district students in our small schools, but we'll find room for them in our charters, some of which are even smaller than our small schools. And then on the very last page, there's continuing discussion about declining enrollment. And as I've pointed out in the past, 
you will see that the largest segment is in the high school where it's 390. Um, kindergarten indeed is dropping considerably, but that is predicted by the demographics as the Great Recession dip, and normally there will be a rebound. And then your K-1-6 is the smallest enrollment decrease. So again, it would seem that if you had a plan, you would want to look at all of your schools, not just the span where you have the smallest decrease. Thank you. Good evening, board. My name is Maria Rodriguez, and um, I'd like to welcome Mr. Forrest. Um, I have two requests for financial information. One is um, that um, I would like to request that Karen Sweat be re allowed again to access financial information. Um, it was a great encouragement when she and I met each other. She understands how to get the information, and I believe that I understand how to read the information. And if for no other reason, then it um, has the appearance of transparency. I believe that that's one request I would like to make. The second is um, regarding reporting. I think that there may be easier ways to show what are restricted accounts that, um, like for instance, last meeting, I came up because I was upset that adult ed had, had, had major cuts over the last three years, yet they were sweeping funds. And I had come to understand that some of those funds have been redirected and allowed to be general funds. But my concern is that I've lost some trust in, in thinking why were these schools, adult schools, allowed to flounder when there was $2 million in Fund 11 um, sitting there, and, and I can be educated on that, but it seems to me that there's a way to say that, instead of calling it Fund 11, saying this is adult education, and having that um, made accessible. Um, an example of that is, is my question then was, how many other restricted funds are there? And um, Mr. Odegaard, um, I um, commend you for the work you've done, but the answer that he gave in response to my and Diana's question was, he addressed the unrestricted reserved funds and the restricted reserved funds of the general fund. And I wasn't asking about the general fund. I was asking about the designated funds. Um, and so that's where miscommunication happens. If Karen and I can access that information, I believe it just would help to, again, appearance-wise. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know point out future board meetings April 18, 2013, 4.30 p.m. closed session, 6.30 p.m. open session here at the Cerna Center. And again, on May 2nd, 2013, same times. Do we have a motion to, I'll move, move to adjourn. Oh, sorry. Just one last, before we leave, I do, I do want to thank, um, this will be Mr. Odegaard's last board meeting that he's attended, and I just wanted to give him a big thanks for all his help and support. Thank you, Richard. Yes, thank you very much. Um, the motion has been seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Opposed extensions, we are adjourned.